Welcome to the Hudson Valley Disc Golf Podcast. This week we are joined by Alex, Corey, Jason, Jamin, Randy, and our guest this week was a guest last week, but we didn't have time to ask him any questions. He's been a PDGA member since 2020 with 81 career events, including an MPO win at this year's Connecticut Flex Series at Tower Ridge. He also holds the current course record at the new Greenville course, which he needed every bit of to tie Randy for second at the inaugural Stonewall Classic. Thanks for coming back, John Hafner. Yeah, thank you again for having me, Pat. So how did you first discover disc golf? In 2019, I was just laying down and I saw a YouTube video. And I think it was like the Las Vegas challenge or something like that. I ended up watching, I think it was a Jomez video, just a full front and back nine. And uh, that's how I discovered it. So I first went out with a, I think it was a 120 gram actual Frisbee branded disc. And I was just throwing it in my yard, like object golf type stuff. How did you find a course? And what course was it? A friend of mine from Dutchess Community College, Savannah Burke, who some of you might know. I, I for some reason, was talking about it. And uh, she said, hey, we have that at Wilcox. That's where I work. Little did I know Wilcox is as good as Wilcox is. So uh, we just went out one day. I think it was a cold, rainy day, but we went out and threw some discs. And for those of you that don't know, Wilcox used to have a bunch of loner discs. I think the brand was Halex, and they were terrible. Looking back on it, the worst discs I've ever touched. Like, So you might think Franklin's pretty bad. These are worse. But I played, I think, a full 18 red with them, and I shot a 99. So you broke 100. Yeah, I've never had a round of disc golf over 100. So I shot a 99 with these discs where I I think two years ago I managed to find one. Uh, That's also a lie, right? I think you've played J27 or or, or whatever. Okay, a 18-hole round over 100. I guess that is a lie, but sure. Marathon (laughs) rounds, I am excluding in that. I took one of these discs a couple of years ago, and I threw it on a grenade, and I think I got three full flips out of it, and then it started gliding again, like a normal disc should. These are insanely flippy. The putter was okay, but I think the mid-range and the driver were the exact same mold, and they were just terrible. What was the brand name of the disc again? I'm pretty sure it was Halex. H-A-L-E-X. Is anybody here familiar with that type of disc? I've never, I've done a lot of disc or no disc, and that does not ring any bells. No. I don't think they're PDGA approved. Oh. I don't even know if the Franklin discs are. Okay, I Googled Some it. Some of them are. Really the first URL is from discgolfreviewer.com, and the preview to the URL on Google is, this is the worst disc golf set I have ever tried. <laughs> <laughs> they're even more unthrowable than the atrocious Aerobi sharpshooters. Yeah, no, they're, they're terrible. It, it's not good. And uh, some of the Franklin discs are approved. My brother got me yeah. some as a gag yeah. gift. Unfortunately, those ones were not approved, but it's, <laughs> I think some of them were. I've seen a couple of those in doing disc or no disc. The closest I got is my mom bought me when I first started playing, like moms do. She's like, oh my God, I saw this at Aldi's of all places. She's <laughs> like, so she got them for me. And it was like, uh, like John said, I'm pretty sure it was like a putter, a mid-range and a driver, but I'm pretty sure the mid-range and the driver were the exact same disc. <laughs> and there's nothing on the disc other than like the word putter, the word mid-range and the word driver. Yeah. And I wouldn't even use them as a dog toy for fear that they could like, <laughs> cut gums or or something i don't know yeah no they're, they're usually pretty stiff discs too like they have zero give and they're just really hard like they, they kind of hurt to just throw <laughs> i'm sure there's still a couple floating around in the uh the wilcox whatever you want to call it the shed the barn the yeah where all the workers go i'm sure there's still a couple there but uh yeah shortly after that i found i think a champion t-bird that i was borrowing from the lost and found each time what about the first disc you bought? It was a starter set, as one does. It was a DX Rock, a DX AVR, and then for some reason it skipped all the way to distance drivers. It was, I think, a DX Destroyer and a DX Boss, all of which are insanely flippy now. I lost the Destroyer. The Boss has teeth marks in it from a dog. I still have the AVR. That's actually a nice disc. And the Rock cracked on me at New York State last year. That was in my bag for a solid four and a half years. Is the AVR still your go-to putter? No, it's it's just sitting on a rack somewhere. I messed around with throwing it. It's a nice little flip up and holds quite a bit of turn putter, but currently out of the bag. You said your your closest course is Wilcox and you play FDR and Stony Kill often. Other than those three, what, what would you say is your favorite local course? Everything I have to drive to is like at least 40 minutes besides Wilcox. 
My favorite local course, I'd probably say, is Mind Kill. I was actually just there yesterday with uh, the whole RPI crew. So Justin Muccelli, Eric Boston Brook, I'm forgetting your last name. Sorry, Eric. And uh, there were nine others that came out as well. But Mind Kill is great. How many unique courses have you played? I think I'm at 88 right now. So mm-hmm. hopefully get to 100 next year. We'll see. Have you played Heiser Creek before? I have. I play terribly at Heiser Creek. I think Randy a couple of years ago, I think it was the Battle of Saratoga. I shot like a plus 13 round there. When I was like 920 rated, I should not have been shooting plus 13 there. You gave up so hard. I remember our last hole we played, you tried to skip a Firebird in from like 30 feet just to like see if you could do it. <laughs> what was the last Sounds hole like we after. played? I think it was hole two, like we were up at the top of the hill. That sounds about right. That's yeah. something I would have would have done. I won't do that anymore. I'm getting smarter. I've been told I've started actually playing golf and, uh, you know, seeing scores go down and ratings go up. Do you remember your first tournament? Yeah, it was uh, it was the Wilcox Wild 2019. So I started in May of 2019 and the first tournament came four or five months later. It was either September or October that year. But I started on hole 16 and I played with Ross O'Toole. So someone who I still see a lot to this day at local tournaments. Um, You mean a lefty flick? Uh, I think I was like 35 over on the day. That might be generous. Uh, It was certainly not a good day. I think I averaged 820 for my first tournament after five months. And then the second one was the... Alex, correct me here. I think it was the Siliciously Sensational Stony Kill Spectacular 2020. And we had that right before everything shut down. You're missing an S. There were five S's. I don't remember what all of them were. <laughs> but Tyler Cockroft ran that. And it's uh, funny looking back at all the people that were playing. I knew, I think, no one at the time. Savannah Burke also played that one. But I knew absolutely no one else. And now looking back on it, it's I probably know almost everybody that played that. What made you decide to sign up for a PDGA? I think I just planned on playing a bunch of tournaments and maybe wanting to get a rating as well. So I signed up in October of 2020. And yeah, yeah, I think that was it. So I had gotten bit. I had the tournament bug. I think I had played a third tournament before I got my number, which was the Camp Brook Open of 2020 when people started getting back into things a little bit. And that's actually where I first met Brian Bickersmith. That was pretty funny. We met online through a Discord server. I don't know if any of you have been watching Foundation Disc Golf long enough to know who Zach Biscardi is. Any takers? No? No. Nope. Nope. So he he was a old member of Foundation and he, he started a Discord channel. I don't know why I joined it, but Bickersmith posted a picture of South Hatchet 7 at Wilcox. And I went, hey, that's Wilcox. So we somehow started messaging over Discord, and then we met in person at the Camp Rook Open. So it was like a meet you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I just planned on playing a bunch of, not a bunch of tournaments, but at least five tournaments the next year, which makes getting the membership worth it because you get that $10 discount if you signed up for tournaments. Yeah, and if you played five tournaments, it kind of pays for itself. Yeah, exactly. And you get a rating and all that fun stuff. And I made the stupid, stupid decision of emailing the PDGA and saying, hey, can you backload all these tournaments that I played? (laughs) So the Camp Rook Open, the Stony Kill Tournament, and Wilcox. And I think my first rating was 823. Threw a couple 700 grade rounds in there. A couple 850s. Look at you now. You're still doing it. (laughs) Yeah, right now, it's pretty bad. I am still doing that. My spread over the past year is an 825 low and a 1018 high. That's literally on brand. I think Muccelli's got me beat. We were talking about that yesterday. He's got a, I think, an 870 low and his 1069 high. Nice. So one day you guys show up as me, the next time you show up as Jamin or Jason? Pretty much. It's getting better. I'm My standard deviation's coming down, but that's attributed to the actual playing smart and playing golf. No more th- running it from 30 feet with a Firebird? No, although one time, Stony Kill dubs, I think I did have five throw-ins from outside 60 feet because I was doing that, but that was doubles. That's mm-hmm. a little different. You ran a league at FDR this year. Was that your first time doing one of those? I guess it was my third. Well, I- actually, that was my fourth league, so the first one I ever did was kind of just me helping out eric bowers a little bit that was at fdr and kisco so if he couldn't make it i'd fill in and i was sourcing some ctp discs for him and then the next year i took it over 
all by myself. And I think it was a eight week league, something like that. I then did a Wilcox league two summers ago, if you include this last summer. And then I did the final wedged league that I did, which you showed up to a couple, Pat. I think quite a few of you did. Jamin was toying with it, but never ended up coming. Alex came to one. Yep. Corey never came, but nah. Corey came, but didn't play in the league. I think he did. Yeah, that's that's right. Oh, that does actually sound really familiar. Yeah, that definitely did happen. Yeah, it was you, <laughs> Kyle. I think you were prepping for a FDR tournament. Yeah. Well, yeah. so Corey, that was the whole point of the league. Mm, well, <clears throat> I didn't want to like play like a rated round, and I don't know what layout you guys were playing, if I remember correctly. Some people say that the leagues drop their ratings. I think my standard turnout for that league is 25 people. The first time I did it on my own, I think I had 53, something like that. It was almost a full course. It was quite a few people. So the ratings generally actually haven't been that bad. Wilcox League gets a little rough sometimes. You don't have a lot of people show up to those. So you can see some funky stuff happen. Will League be returning? I think so. I don't have anything planned yet, but it's a nice way to gear up for the Fool's Fest. So... I don't think I'm going to do 10 weeks this year. That was a little long. It's tough to commit, especially being on two team challenge teams, but probably a six week league. I think we can get four different FDR layouts in. So that would be yellow, yellow front, white back, white front, yellow back, and then all white. And then we throw two Kisco rounds in there and that gets you to your minimum of six. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll probably do something. Wedge doesn't really know it yet. I kind of just did it on my own last year and said, hey, Wedge League. And they were fine with it. Any major changes this year? I don't know. I think last year was pretty good. I threw a bunch of money at it through some, I guess if you want to call it added cash in. So I paid the top three of each division. I think it was like a hundred bucks, 75 bucks, then 50 bucks for first, second, third. And uh, it only costs you $2 to play each week. So it's worth the money. Unless you want to throw CTPs in, those are an extra two bucks. But I think it's going to be hard to top that. So I'll probably just do something similar again. And I had Jack Bradley also throw some cash in last year. That was much appreciated from him. So you're currently rated 936. Is that your highest rating to date? Unfortunately, yeah. We're looking to grow that a little bit. I got some old stinker rounds to kick out of there, but that's usually my issue. I'll average 950 and then I'll throw two rounds in the 800s and just drag it all down. But yeah, currently my highest by, I think, four points. I think my previous was 932. What helped you make the decision to go pro? Was it a rating or something else? I've got too many damn discs. So yeah, I don't need stuff from players packs. Might as well play for money. I'm going to play tournaments anyway. It's only like an extra 10 bucks usually for a pro entry fee. So why not? When was that that you made the decision? I think it was Fool's Fest 2023. I had played a couple before that, but that was the first big one. And that's pretty much when I consistently started just playing open. And I actually cashed at that tournament. I think I tied with Jamin. Mm. Ooh, another one. I'm not sure what that means, Corey. (laughs) Well, I was trying to figure that out myself. I forgot Heiser was weeks ago. Just another publicly getting called out by someone you don't want to tie with. (laughs) Although, I mean, I don't know. Hapter's got... I'd say we're, we're similar. I wouldn't take it personally. I think part of being competitive is not wanting to tie with anybody. That's kind of why I play mm. the sport. Mm, that is a great response, actually. There you go, Hafter. Write that down. <laughs> It'll get better by not being satiated by ties, but by crushing the field. I never said I was satiated by ties. It just sometimes happens, though. <laughs> Maybe part of getting better at golf is just sometimes accepting the outcome, Corey, and uh, moving on from that. It's in the past. Mm, you could argue for or against that, sure. Not allowed. <laughs> is there a process that you need to go through with the PDGA to become professional, or do you just like accept cash at a tournament and it automatically bumps you up? That's funny. So Alden Slack and I, I I play with Alden a lot. We entered a doubles tournament at Gunks and we each, I think, got 38 bucks cash because we won MPO with a two team field. And that was enough to uh, trigger the PDGA to say, hey, you're a pro now. And uh, it just automatically happens when you take cash. So you can either pay the extra 25 bucks willingly or it just bumps you when you take cash. So you won an MPO dubs event and won $13? Yeah, it paid for that next year, I guess. Yeah, uh, that's funny. Yeah, do not take cash if you're an amateur and it's only 38 bucks. Don't do it. (laughs) Well, I got a question for everybody and I'll start with you, John. Is there a rating, at least in this area, is there a number that you see and you're like, oh, that guy should be a pro? I'd probably put it around 950. If you're at least 950 rated, I feel like you can do well in pro in the local scene. At least 
you know, have some good days. It doesn't mean you're going to be consistent, but. All right. Uh, Corey, what do you think? Mm, Josh stole my answer. 950. Alex. Yeah, 950 was the the number I had in my head. I could theoretically see going down to like 940-ish, depending. But yeah, 950 feels like a pretty solid number where it's like, why are you still playing MA1 at 950 rated? Mm -hmm. Unless there's like a specific reason, like you're trying to trying to play Worlds or trying to play some sort of AM championship. All right. Uh, Randy? Yeah, I think 950 is is that number at, at our local level. Jason? Uh, I'm going to say 970. Oh, is that what it is officially? That's the official designation where you can't play AM if you cash. You could be a 1020 rated disc golfer and still play MA1 because the theory is that the amateur side doesn't have a cap once you get to advanced. You know, you're just not accepting cash. That's the only difference between an advanced amateur player and a pro. But if you do take cash, then you can't play in events if you're over 970. And I'm just kind of always accepted that. And that's where I think it's at. Jamin? Yeah, I mean, I think locally you're going to see 950, but I'm with Jason where play whatever fucking division you want. <laughs> that's, yeah. All right. I was curious. That's a good answer. Family feud. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have any other questions? Open field, no wind. Hell yeah. <laughs> oh, God. 200 feet. What disc are you throwing and what line are you throwing that you feel most confident that you'll base it? Just a zone on a hyzer. Consistent. Boring. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is boring. It's uh, the way to do it, though. <laughs> All right. So you just had an 820 rated round. What did you throw? <laughs> I probably threw, excluding a firebird straight at it probably a watt straight at it give it a nice floaty run but end up going 40 feet past still okay a watt what's that that's an mvp disc i alex flight numbers i don't know the numbers <laughs> off the top of my head it's relatively neutral i want to say like 3301 or something like that okay well it's a two speed i know that two four three sounds right and then yeah it's, it's just it's like some people call it the glitch's big brother uh, it's just a straight putter. Corey, do you have a question? Yeah. So, uh, Jonathan, you got a uh, wedge, not wedge winter league coming up. It's week one. League doesn't start until one o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, you decide that you're going to go to one of those fake rock climbing places. Yeah. Where you like climb a giant piece of plastic and uh, yeah. they have a bunch of mats in the ground in case, in case you fall. You decided that you left your weighted vest at home because you've been hitting them weights as well trying to get that strength up and all you had on you was your disc golf bag and we all know how heavy disc golf bags can get especially if you got vice grips in there <laughs> yep um so you strap your disc golf bag to your back and you walk into the strip mall that has the rock climbing apparatuses in it and you know, you, you chalk your hands up <laughs> and you start climbing up this rock wall. With my bag on. With your bag on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're doing like weight training while also getting your grip strength. So you do a couple reps. Afterward, you figure you're going to go to the uh, the snack bar, get a couple of Uncrustables and maybe an Appy Juice to wash it all down with. And then you leave. You go to Wedge League and you realize that you left your bag at the sports complex. Is my wallet in the bag? Because I, I just did recently do that. Not a sports complex. Well, at your leagues that you run, for some reason, you get free entry, so you don't even need your wallet. You're just taking everybody else's. <laughs> However, you don't have your bag. All you have is whatever is in your car. What three discs are in your car right now that are loose are you going to use to play Wedge League at FDR? Right now. Let's see. What do we got? I think I'm putting with a Mako 3. Good answer. I think I'm throwing a DDX and a PD. I have a bunch of old disc mania in my card right now. Are you going to win with a putting with a Mako 3 and throwing a PDX all over the place? A DDX, not a PDX. Uh, DDX. Who's playing? Ryan Nelson and Jack Bradley. Those are the only people that showed up. <laughs> Well, you know he's always going to come in second, no matter who's there. <laughs> Historically, he just comes in second. That's a good point. I think I come in second with my full bag or with those discs. Oh, okay. So you got it locked in then. Yeah. All right. So what's your go-to course beverage? This is really boring. Water. Yeah, I'm not much of a drinker, so water it is. What? I, the last time I was in your car, there was literally an unopened bottle of whiskey or something. Uh, uh, Randy, fact check me on this. It's true, but it was unopened, so it was unopened. Don't know I, if I do drinker. drink it, but it was unopened. Mm, I'm yeah, not drinking that on the course, though. I'm not Ryan Nelson. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> 
What's your go-to off-the-course beverage? Some type of bourbon, usually, if we're talking alcoholic. But hear me out. Talking non-alcoholic, I can put away an easy half gallon of milk a day. Serial killer. I get it. <laughs> no, so, so it's easy calories, right? Mm. I think a half gallon of milk is like 1,500 calories, something like that. Maybe a teeny bit less, but it's easy, saves time. You don't have to cook. Wait, wait, wait. Anyone else in this chat <laughs> is like looking to pack in calories. <laughs> we live very different lives. <laughs> you do. I'm never like, oh, shit, where are all my calories today? <laughs> mm. That's hilarious because I've definitely had like sometimes my go to dinners when I'm home late and like I just got to pile something down my throat is like some PBRs and pretzel sticks dipped into a jar of peanut butter. But I've never came home and like, man, I need some calories. I mean, just drink <laughs> half a gallon of milk to cover it. <laughs> So yeah, milk, peanut butter, easy calories. It goes down fast. And uh, yeah. I think you're really sleeping on melted ice cream here, JP. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I also peg Hafner as like an unpasteurized milk kind of guy. No, no. Oh, right from the udder? We're talking Stewie's whole milk. Hmm. Yeah, that's that good stuff. He's a fitness freak, not a psychopath. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Stewart claims two days from teat to table. <laughs> or something like that. Is that their advertising slogan? Teat to table? <laughs> I don't know, but it should be. I feel like that'd be that'd be great. I bet it's been workshopped. <laughs> <laughs> and just to quote the actual Stewart shops top 10 reasons why Stewart's milk is the best. They literally say the milk goes from farm to the shop in 48 hours or less. I really think that they're leaving some some room on the table for for the old teat the table in two days or less. <laughs> Absolutely. So, John, what do you got coming up disc golf-wise? Just team challenge stuff. Well, so Corey mentioned last week there's a Wilcox tournament coming up. That's the only PDGA sanctioned thing I'm signed up for. But team challenge, so I'm on... Widowmakers and Stony Killers. So two matches a month. I was a little disappointed I didn't get into Burbine. I was uh, not begging. Or maybe I was begging. Jeff might put it as begging to get into Burbine. I didn't get mm -hmm. in. I was there, though. So I got to see all the MPO action. Wasn't that not even like by the time they played it, it wasn't even a full tournament? That's what I was going to ask. Correct. Just didn't want to reopen registration for you? Pretty much. Yeah, it was fine. I just, uh, again, watched MPO the whole day. So, so the thing is, the more I walked Burbine and the more I saw all the trees, I was kind of like, this might have just been a good thing. I've played Burbine before, but you kind of forget if you haven't been there in a while. So, But I might play the Winterberry Open. It's got some spots open. That's over at Westy Acres. The FDR Two Town Turkey Trot is opening up, I believe, in two days. The Wilcox, and then that would be it. The FDR thing, is that going to be the 72, or are they doing both still? Or they're having 144, do you know? 144 players, 72 each course. Right. What about actually just playing? What do you got coming up? I play with Alden and Scott Mosher a lot, the famous Scott Mosher. So Scott's moving away. He's not moving away. He's kind of like a nomad. He's going up to Vermont this summer or this winter. It's not summer. So probably just going to get around in with him hopefully next Sunday. I think that's the last chance I'll have. So probably myself, Alden, and him who are usually the ones hitting up Wilcox in the middle of the week or just on any given weekend. What do you got this week? This week, I don't have anything scheduled, but I'm taking a work trip down to southern Texas and then driving into Mexico. But one of my buddies, Ben Vondrak, who used to live in the area, moved down to McAllen, Texas. So that's where I'm flying into. Hopefully I'll get to go to a league night down there. And then Saturday morning before my flight, I am definitely going to get in a round down there. I, I went down there last December, so I'm not a stranger to those courses, but it's going to be nice to get a round in with him down in Texas again. So for work, you're going to Mexico, but you're going to go to Texas to play disc golf. Yeah. So we're driving into Mexico each day. So, uh -huh. you know, there's a league, I think Thursday night, which I'm going to try to go to. And then yeah, Saturday morning. Awesome. So your next team challenge is going to be New York on the ninth. Yeah. Against the Chatham team. And for New England, it's not until next month. Yeah. I think it's the 16th, right, Alex? I believe that's the plan. Yeah. And that's, that's at Amesbury pines so we're gonna have to bring our helmets for that one that is a <laughs> scary course to go to yeah is it like in the middle of a paintball field or what's what's, what's so <laughs> i i think all 18 holes are on something like 12 acres i i think i traced it out on some sort of map last year and then they calculated the acreage for me and it's it's something really small mm. so you have a lot of fairways super tight to each other the last time we were there one of our team members joey tota 
actually hit a guy right in the back of the head, sent him to the hospital. He had to get four staples in the back of his head. Right. And neither player was doing anything particularly weird. Yeah, no, I don't even think Joey threw a bad shot. He threw a hard forehand that might have been slightly to the left of where you'd normally throw it. But I mean, it, like it was a reasonable shot. He's still assuming the disc had finished his flight. He still would have had a very reasonable chance at birdie. And the other guy was standing at edge of circle. And it's just like, well, I mean, that's kind of why we try not to have holes that close together. Mm. I actually like all the holes there. They're just so close to each other. The whole one's a fantastic. You have a bunch of old pine trees there. It makes some really cool looking fairways. It's just uh, packed into a sardine can. Just to give me an idea, uh, because I'm curious, that whole 18 at Greenville, since most everybody here is familiar with it, how many acres would you say that is, that hole? Five. I was going to say four. I was going to say four, yeah. All right. No, that's good. That's helpful. I never really consider holes in terms of acres. You're talking three times the size of that hole, and you have 18 holes in there. That's crazy. Yeah, I think like the general rule is like an acre per hole for like safety and design sake. Like once you get below that, you have to start putting stuff on top of each other or being like just really creative with the terrain. Hmm. An acre per hole would be bare minimum. Yeah. Like Crandall is about an acre per hole, and that's like less than 4,000 feet. So speaking of New England team challenges, Jason, are you playing with the – Disc captains this year? Yeah, I'm on disc captains looking forward to our first match. And you, Jamin, and Corey all have a match this week, right? Oh, yeah, we do. Yeah. Who are you playing where? I'm playing at Jay Park. Is it Rhode Island coming to us? Yep. Okay, yeah. So I don't know a lot about the team, but I'm feeling pretty good about it. I did some match play yesterday and shot like my personal best at Jay Park. So going into this weekend, I'm feeling pretty good. What's the rundown, Jamin? What's this Rhode Island team got? So they have some good players. They've always got the crafty Jim Coyle, hmm. and then other former wedge guy, Ian Chadwick. So those are two of their better players. Um, they've got a pretty decent roster. I haven't seen all of it yet because at the beginning of the season, most teams don't fill out their rosters more than they need to for a little bit of flexibility. So there's going to be a couple players I haven't seen yet, that kind of stuff. But this is a team that we've played before at Jay Park. We played them at their place. It, so we've played them a few times. They're fairly good, but they're not nearly as good on the road or the actual road than they are at home. They do good at courses near their course because I don't think too many of them actually use their home course as a course that they play often. You know, being in that neck of the woods, Rhode Island isn't really home for most of them. It's just southeastern Mass and eastern Connecticut. All right. Corey, what are your predictions for Disc Captain's Team Challenge 2024-25 season? How many wins and losses do you make at the finals, and how do you do there? Uh, yeah, so we go to finals, and we sweep Team Tank, and we move up to B-Pool after going 2-0 and in finals. I think that's Sounds how that about works. right. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jason messaged everybody. What's in that circle is three and a half acres? Yeah. I feel pretty good about that then, because I was basically drawing a square, like, to include the whole thing. I did the same thing, but I made a much bigger area to account for the shanks. Uh, and actually, that's yeah, Jason, I don't think your drive landed. <laughs> I would say I was off the fairway, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's three and a half by, like, if you throw it exactly how you should, but if you're a disc golfer, it's probably four plus. Oh, yeah. I mean, I could stretch that out to six acres plus easily. Mm. Okay. I'm sorry. So, Corey, you're going to finals and you're going to move up to B pool? Yeah, I don't think we're going to have as much of trouble with Team Tank as the D pool did. I think we're going to show them what it's like to be in C pool. Uh, the disc captains are going to do that. Right. And then I just feel sorry for their top guy after he gets smoked by me. <laughs> Corey is beating Dylan Capaccioli. You heard it here first. Oh, is he on there? Yeah, I'm not worried. <laughs> you know what you got to do, Jamin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a plan now. So, Jason, what are your predictions for Disc Captain's Team Challenge season this year? Uh, I predict we're going to have a lot of fun because we got some OGs coming back. We got Harry and Josh playing again, so it's going to be a good time. I think we're going to do very well at home now that we got Harry. There's definitely some strong teams from what I've heard. I haven't like been following it too closely, but I don't know. It's tough for me to make any predictions. But that's what's fun about it, Jason. <laughs> Uh, how many teams are there? There's, uh, eight in the league? Yeah. play seven? I'm going to say we go four and three. Make finals? Yeah. How do you predict in finals? Uh, we uh, 
Hmm. I don't know. I think it's going to be tough for us to move the B pool. Okay. But finals, that means we are definitely staying in C. So, okay. Yeah. But do you think we're going to have an early day at finals or a long as fuck day and have to play three rounds and still go home losers? Is that how that works? Yeah, it's going to be long. Yeah. All right. Jamin, save you for last. Figure you have the most information and could give the most accurate, no pressure, prediction. What do you got? <laughs> um, I don't know about accurate, but no, I think that. <laughs> I think we're going to have a good season. I see us going four and three as long as, you know, we kind of get some good attendance and some key matches. And I think that four and three will be good enough for finals this year. That's really interesting. Usually there's a team or two in, in the pool where you're like, all right, this team is going to lose at home. And we don't really have that this year. So I think this one might be the most like traditionally New England team challenge season we've seen in a while in the C pool. So if we go four and three, that'll probably put us in finals. And I think that we'll win at least one match in finals. And, you know, that's anything can happen. You only need to win two to move up. So we'll see what happens. But I think we'll get there. As Jason said, picking up Josh Wynn and Harry Lehman is always welcome. We also, we got a couple extra people on the team this year. So roster moves are going to be kind of interesting. But one of the people that it's looking like we're going to have for this Saturday is Ethan Hatters. Mm. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. I'm excited to get him there. He's uh, taking the spot that his grandfather vacated like four or five years ago, I guess. So it's it looks like it's going to be a good season. I'm excited. It's a great group of people. We're finally getting a uh, Disc Captain's merch order going, which I'm thankful for because I've been trying to do that for three years with no luck. Nice. Ethan just won uh, Burbine, didn't he? He did. Yep. All right. Pretty good. What about this Team Tank? What are your thoughts? I, I haven't scouted their roster yet i scouted their roster from last year and uh i think deepo was just a little bit scared <laughs> i think there's there's certainly strong players there i'm not going to say that they're not a strong team you know they're hard to beat but bellamy had their first match against them and was only back by five points in singles wait five or two it was close which was a sh- shocker because bellamy i don't feel like is one of the strongest teams in in the division so for them playing them as hard as they did at Oakholm, i felt like okay maybe maybe they're uh, the read on this team isn't quite as accurate as i expected yeah, i think you guys are all just afraid of dylan he's just a big teddy bear <laughs> he's a teddy bear that's gonna kick Corey's ass but he's a teddy bear <laughs> oh man he doesn't know the mind games i'm gonna play <laughs> <laughs> why is this guy giving up so many strokes at the start <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah. And lull him into a false sense of fear. Yeah. yeah. So I was incorrect. Tank only beat Bellamy by five for the day. Mm, dang. Mm, dang. Yeah. So that was, uh, you know, maybe maybe Bellamy traded up a whole lot, but their roster has an awful lot of names that I recognize on them. So we'll see. We're getting to this point in the next couple of years where all of these, you know, really like strong lower pool teams are going to keep moving up. And it's going to get to a point where that A pool and the B pool are going to have like too many strong teams and they're going to one of those really good teams is going to come back. We're already seeing it this year with Maine who a few years ago everybody was ogling at and now they got demoted. So it's going to be interesting to see how the league kind of shuffles itself out. All right. The only event I saw this past weekend was Burbine. Was there anything else? Fence, no. There was a bunch of local people that went up to Vermont for the Smuggler's Notch play and stay weekend. What's that? So this is my first time going, but I'm pretty sure there's a few weekends throughout the year where Smuggler's Notch Resort kind of like advertises a stay and play weekend for disc golf where basically covers lodging for two nights. You get like unlimited use of both courses. I mean, it's scheduled tea times, but basically the tea time cost is covered. They give you like a buffet breakfast for two of the mornings. They do a glow golf round and they also provide like a care package that has some discounts for the pro shop, a little Vermont sampler like a four pack of beer and cider and some Vermont cheddar cheese and chocolate. I think that basically covers it all. But there's like a, a group of nine of us went up, myself and Jamin included in that group. And then um, we also saw another small group of disc cappers, Evan Parsley, Ryan Yaddow, Kyle Moore. But also we went up there with Kyle Hirsch and Chad Larson and Lil A.B., Anthony Bohansky, some other disc cappers, Adam Selman, Tim Jardini. 
Who else would we go with, Jamin? Thomas Viscona, uh, Phillips Fraskinators, Brother Ted and North. I was not listening for completion of the list, I'll be honest. <laughs> I probably missed somebody, but... Yeah. <laughs> so it's not a tournament, it's just come out and play the course. With the nine people, did you make like a ad hoc tournament kind of thing? Some of us got up there early Friday, we played some rounds, some people left early and didn't play all day Sunday, so we kind of like mixed everything up so that everyone had a chance to play with everybody else at least once. So a few times we did like groups of three, we might have did like a three-man scramble from like, you know, one of the sets of tees, and not like any hardcore like competition, but kind of shake things up a little bit. This doesn't necessarily mean this past weekend, but do you guys in general, and I mean kind of everybody on here, do you gamble with disc golf like 10, 20 bucks on the round or no? 100 I really have. I'm going to start playing with JP more. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Jesus, we supplementing my income. Brandon Lockhart, if I'm playing with him, he's a Warwick guy. He usually wants to put money on a round. Yeah, it's just, it adds a little something to the round. Why not? Oh, no, I'm not judging. I'm just curious. I Because I, most of these other guys, I, as long as they've been on, I figured they would have mentioned it at some point, but I've never really heard that. So I guess that jives. Was there anything else on that the weekend? Well, we kind of lucked out to have three days in a row of absolutely perfect weather. I think it was probably the same downstate and around here in New York. But I mean, it was sunshine, a little chilly in the morning, but warmed up to, you know, upper 60s, low 70s. Actually, kind of funny on the way up there. I think we were driving through Stowe, which is below like Smuggler's Notch, getting off one of the main highways, driving through an intersection. We're going down this line of cars and first you see a couple of Mini Coopers and it's like, oh, look, a couple of Mini Coopers. And then the further down the line you drove, it was just all Mini Coopers. Like there legit was like 25 Mini Coopers in a line waiting at this red light. We get to Smuggler's Notch and apparently they were all there. There was like some like Mini Cooper convention. So all weekend, it looked like the goddamn Italian job with Mark Wahlberg driving around. There was just Mini Coopers everywhere. <laughs> but, you know, I don't know. That's all I got. <laughs> it was a good disc golf weekend. A lot of Mini Coopers in the area. The one other thing I will add is this place, Smuggler's Notch, like they hail themselves as like a mecca for disc golf. Beautiful property. You know, they got the pro shop going. They got both courses. Yet their main parking area is right in the danger zone of where people's disc hyzer off and land into. I smacked the car this year at Bro. Hole 18, you're throwing downhill. It seems like there is always a tailwind or at least right to left blowing right to where all the cars are parked. And it blows my mind that they have all this property and all this land. I don't know what's... I feel like you drive by another lot near the place, but like people's cars are constantly getting pelted by high speed drivers <laughs> to the point to where even like, I don't really give a shit about my car that much, but like I didn't want to park it where I know people can like get to. Like I was trying to park either as close to the pro shop as possible or as far away as possible. Cause like you could sit in the parking lot, like, you know, enjoying a beer, waiting for your next tea time and guaranteed that one out of the three cars that are going to come by, someone's going to put one in the parking lot and hit a car. It kind of surprises me that nothing has been done to mitigate that. I'm sure it's been like that for years. I don't know. How it to, adds to the fun. As long as it's not your car. <laughs> Same thing happens at like baseball or something. Yeah. And I mean. Not kickball, though, Corey. Yeah. I feel like you have a much lower chance of a baseball coming out of the stadium and hitting your car. Hmm. But, I'm talking about like foul balls. Yeah. But I mean, like it's a really good chance that your car gets hit. <laughs> as fun as <laughs> not. And, and not even that. They have a practice basket outside of the um the pro shop and like in between the pro shop and like the another small parking lot. And I literally watched a guy airball his pot on the practice basket and right into the side of a BMW. <laughs> <laughs> like, he, he airballed a 25 footer right to a BMW. Or well, at least it's only a putt. Yeah, it was only a putt. I mean, but I, I just like you can hole 18 is like up this hill and say you're three or 400 feet away from wherever the car is that you just hit, but it hits hard. Mm. You could hear it way up there. Yeah, I, I hit some guys with his driver's side window and uh, I didn't crack it or anything, but it was loud. I was playing from the blue tee, and uh, it smacked this window. It didn't damage it, but it left some plastic on it, for sure. I throw a forehand off that tee, though, so it wasn't coming in with as much speed as a hysering backhand would. 
I mean, even just, okay, take the car out of the equation. Say you're getting your shit together and putting your shoes on, and then some dude, yeah, what if you hit somebody? Halo yeah. Destroyer comes in and crushes your skull. Like, they put the giant net up on the side of hole seven to protect this from going into the neighboring farmer's field. I don't know that they could do the same thing near the parking lot. Yeah, there's not really anything that they can string up there. I guess unless they put, like, a bunch of poles in to string a net up, there's nothing you can really build. I've definitely watched Harry Chase, though, just <laughs> ties their discs right into that parking lot. That's exactly what they could do, though. Like, they could just do that. That's what they did the first time. <laughs> well, they did that on whole seven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, but that's what I'm saying. It's like, yeah, if you take out the part that they did do, they probably couldn't do anything else. They could just do it again. And actually, I was thinking of, like, it'd be tough to put a net on the fairway side of the road to block this, but really all they would have to do is put a net on the park lot yeah side that's right. like 20 feet tall so it would just catch this from going into the parking lot i'm gonna write bernie sanders he's still the governor over there right <laughs> always and <laughs> yes, forever bernie yeah. sanders is the governor of vermont yeah the senator yes, jerry I mean, garcia is the <laughs> uh, even better than anything else of note this past week Corey? not for me no i rambled enough all right uh jamin anything else on the trip or anything else of note this past week no it was super fun it was really nice to just get out to that course and just play rounds for fun. Like anytime I'm there, I'm stressed out because I'm trying to do well in a tournament, all that kind of stuff. And just being able to go out and play the course without really worrying about it a bunch is freaking awesome. Hmm. Oh, one thing. Yeah, I think I watched more baseball over the weekend than I have in the past like year and a half. And all I did was I think watch, well, I fell asleep through one of the games or maybe both the games. <laughs> but uh, yeah, did watch some of that Yankees series. Oh, yeah. I'm sure you were watching that, right, Pat? The only Yankees I watched all year, other than when they played the Mets, was probably the last two innings of, what was it, game five, when uh, Soto hit the three-run home run to win the series. I don't watch much of the Yankees. My mom does. Actually, I did have one comment about it. If you watch the Yankees, you're really old. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I could not imagine watching that much baseball without the pitch clock, the, the pitch clock or whatever, mm -hmm. the change. Holy shit. Like they were actually and and I don't know if, if anything else has changed in baseball. Like, do they do pitchers pitch less than they used to? Yes. The starting pitchers don't go as long. But because there were so many pitching changes, they made a rule that if you come in as a reliever for the inning, you either have to finish out the inning or pitch to at least three guys. Because they used to have guys come in for you know a lefty to pitch to a lefty, and then they would take them out. Mm. Now, if you come into the game, you have to pitch to a, at least three guys or finish out the inning. It's supposed to cut down on pitching changes. Not that I watched a lot of baseball before, but I just remember thinking while watching is like, I don't remember seeing this many wild pitches. Yeah. Like, it just seems like guys, like they don't have to worry about having to pitch half a game or most of a game. So they just come in, they just start rifling things. So like pitches are hitting the dirt, the catcher's having to stand up. They're like all over the place. I think you got that backwards, though. Because pitchers started throwing full effort all the time, they can't go as far as long as they used to. Mm, yeah, okay. I'm not an old head or whatever. I'm fine with the game how it is. But used to be that, you know, Nolan Ryan would come in, Greg Maddox, a ton of them. They would know, like, you don't have to throw 100% effort every pitch. But try to tell a guy now that when they're making a lot more money than they were when Nolan Ryan was pitching. You know what I mean? You have to do max effort every pitch. Otherwise, if I give up a home run, why didn't I throw that max effort? It's a bit of a conundrum because I think it's causing more injuries because guys don't know how to pace themselves. And not for nothing, but mixing up your speeds, throwing softer. If you throw 100, if you throw 95, that's actually a, a bit of a change up to a guy. You know, if he's expecting 100. But on the flip side, if you're throwing 100, you're putting a little extra force into it and you have a chance of throwing a wild pitch. If you throw it 95, you can pinpoint it a little better. So there's a lot of a lot of factors and I'm not advocating either way, but I definitely think that the pitch clock has helped. I watched a lot of the Mets. Honestly, if they had won last night, I'd be watching that game right now. And Corey would be asking John all the questions earlier. <laughs> no, but was that everything for yep. your week? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jason, what have you been up to the last week or so? Anything new at Greenville? Yeah. So at Greenville, I've been trying to like grow this relationship with the town and the park and stuff. So I've been going to the meetings. Like there's a nonprofit 
meeting with the park. Went there just to kind of give updates about the event that we did. I brought some discs to show them what the discs look like. Went over some like numbers with UDISC and stuff and went really well. And they actually, the president of the nonprofit motion to fund the remaining tees and also a nice kiosk. So I think they have like $5,000 allotted for like a full size kiosk, like the state parks design has. Where would that go? So that would go. So like if you drive past the pavilion, there's that gate. It'd be like just past the gate to the left. Okay. Really, it's just going to have information and such, right? Mostly. Yeah. Big map of the course is key. A lost and found is key. And then, um, you know, we want to kind of like go over like the layouts, how they're seasonal. And then also just like some basics about disc golf and some like just fundamentals because it's such a new sport in the area. And then we're also looking at for the signs, there's like an ornithologist or something that can get grants if we include include um like bird information so we're going to do like tea signs with like half disc golf and then half like educational like some kind of wildlife i'm so excited to like do that i'm kind of working on designs for that sign is randy the ornithologist uh he could be <laughs> i'm sure i could uh we could have a good time doing that can you th- come up with 18 birds that would be at greenville <laughs> yeah i mean not right now but yeah <laughs> all right i got like at least six so easy um yeah so exciting news there wait, wait, wait. give me a couple of those what are a couple of the birds jason come on all right about. you got like blue jay you got the blue heron i've seen them there i think i've seen a bald eagle turkey vultures yeah turkey vultures <laughs> is a turkey vulture something you want to put on a disc golf sign if you need 18 maybe <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you have like those sparrows. Oh, you have the geese that fly, or I guess they're the geese or ducks. I think they're ducks. So they're probably just, both. Yeah, probably it just depends both. on when. Oh yeah, we're a big uh, duck town. Actually, like I don't know if you guys are familiar with like the Green County towns, but like Catskill, they have these. I don't know if they're ceramic or what, but they're different cats. They're like sculptures, and they go in front of the businesses. And different artists from Catskill design these different cats and they all go to different businesses and then they auction them off. Well, each town in like Green County has been like mimicking that. So I forget what Kiksaki does. They made it like bears or something. I think Sargadies is horses. Anyway, Greenville's ducks. So like there's all these artists working on ducks. So it's kind of went off on a tangent, but we have ducks at Greenville for sure. Did I even get six? Because I kind of feel like I was stalling the track. Oh, I think we went to more than six. If we count the turkey vultures, it's like 10. I don't know. Well, but that was, I think yeah, you're good. Corey, but <laughs> now I'm thinking about birds. But anyway, yeah, so we got some like stuff in the works there. Yes. A lot of work left to do on the course, but it's good that we have the funding to, to keep things moving, kind of keep momentum going. I have been seeing a ton of people playing the course, like way more than I was expecting, which is great. I just uh, wish we had better navigation out there for them. I've had some like, like Greg Hertz call me today because he's trying to figure out where hole 17 was. And we had pulled all the T signs and navigational signs after the event because they're all temporary we didn't want kids messing with them and also this like we want to have a really good aesthetic with the disc golf course and those were like all temp stuff so i think i've alluded to it before but there's some mischievous people i'm assuming Mm. they're kids i'm hoping they're not adults but they like messing with the disc golf course moving stuff yeah so i'm looking forward to getting permanent baskets permanent tea signs permanent everything then uh don't have to worry about that heck yeah so the the baskets are on back order. Innova is very far behind with yellow tops. So as a kind of like a temporary solution, um, I talked to Kenji and there's uh, some baskets at Corey's house that were ordered for somewhere else. So we're going to install those. And then when the Greenville baskets come, we're going to switch the tops because the only difference is the ones at Corey's are white and the ones we're getting are yellow. Are those the ones that Mark Bryan wanted? <laughs> he expressed interest, I think, particularly, <laughs> but I gave him buckets and soggy wood instead. Oh, is that the, well, for Fortin, I think? <laughs> yeah, he, he wanted uh, posts and buckets for to testing layouts for that Fortin Park. Gotcha. As far as coursework, I mean, is, is there much else that's going to be done this year? So my goal this year is to set some more sleeves. I'm not going to have all the back nine or I guess other nine sleeves in, but the ones that the kids are messing with, I want to get those baskets in. And then I also want to finish the pavers that we started and do a little bit more for navigation. And that's like my goal this year. And then next year, I want to hit the rest of it hard. I want to do the the kiosk, which I think actually there some of the people in the non profit may like assist with that. So that might happen sooner. But my plan is to maybe work on over the winter in my barn and then install it next year. Yeah, so that's the up there in Greenville. Other than that, I've been in the Empire Open match play bracket. I played Harry Lehman yesterday. So I think I mentioned it before, but 
shot like my personal best at J Park. We played the J27 layout and by the time I won, we had a total of 25 birdies between the two of us. So it was pretty epic. It was like throw-ins, huge putts. I hit metal on hole 18 off my drive. Yeah, it was just a really good round. A lot of fun, great weather. Harry's always fun to play with. So now I move on to Chad Larson, which I'm trying to schedule. We haven't talked about that in so long. I totally forgot about that. It sounds like sort of metal on 18. Yeah. And what did you throw? A roadrunner. It looks so good the whole way, too. Like, it just made that hole seem like it had a viable fairway for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who's the mythical creature that aced it before? I'm blanking on his name. Tom Oldfather. Yeah, he did it with a leopard, didn't he? Leopard, leopard three. 3. Oh, I believe yeah. that. Way faster. Damn, and you had to step all the way up to a roadrunner? <laughs> well, yeah. I, mean, I don't have the arm speed, I guess. So <laughs> yeah. Pretty beat in roadrunner, too. It's been slow. Honestly, in hindsight, I think they do like a double elimination this year. I think that was a mistake because there's just too many matches this schedule in a year and it's the finals gonna be a mind kill it's gonna be snow there mm. there's still a lot of matches left well last year harry beat you and ended up winning it so no pressure yeah i don't have any pressure i just want to get <laughs> done with it honestly <laughs> but yeah it'll, it'll, i gotta beat chad twice i think because he hasn't lost yet so we'll see maybe i'll play him at mind kill speaking of mind kill it's kind of preliminary and usually the pga doesn't say to announce anything until november 1st but i think dan doyle has already started spilling the beans the uh, preliminary a-tier schedules out for tds to check it so there'll be four a-tiers in new york this year which is kind of exciting. so does that mean i'm not supposed to talk about what dan doyle posted today it's public about now. an hour ago I mean, it's, 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 it's public, public now, yeah. I was going to say, spilling the beans, he threw them all over the room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> October uh, 3rd and 4th, Wilcox Wow is going to be an A-tier next year. Wait, yeah. isn't the 4th and the 5th? 4th and 5th. 4th and 5th. Okay, you know what? <laughs> Same thing. First weekend in October. <laughs> November 7th and 8th, 2026. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So Minekill and Wilcox, what were the other two? Oh, Warwick and Rochester? Uh, not Rochester. Syracuse finally got approved, and they're actually moving oh, the nice. event to uh, September. So, yeah, it'll be Minekill in June, Warwick in July, Syracuse in September, and Wilcox in October. Looks like I'm playing four A-tiers next year then. I was going to say, that's kind of lopsided New York, you know? Western New York. We don't count Syracuse as Western New York. Uh, that's Central New York. There is a, uh amateur A-tier in Rochester, but they've been having for years but i don't mm. i really just keep an eye on the pro and... mm -hmm. that's cool for the empire open 2024 group a looks like jeff ernst and nathan marizio are in the finals chad larson and jason lasasso in group b group c todd springer and james kalinsky and in group d is dylan reese and Matthew Spinner. So they're down to eight. Nice. The fact that the finals is at my kill, I feel pretty good if I beat Chad. <laughs> is that because Harry picked it? Because he was last year's winner? Yeah. Although Dylan is like tough to beat at Mind Kill, but he was one of the first couple winners, right? He's won M MPO a few times, and then I think he won MP40 last year as eighth year. But he just got married this past uh, weekend, so, so he's, he's yeah, he's, yeah, awesome. Uh, it's just been confirmed. Tom Oldfather did ace eighteen with a leopard three. What do you mean just confirmed? You got yeah, it. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, I got it from the source, Tom Oldfather himself. Yeah, would you wake him up? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to message Dan Doyle right now and find out what Wilcox Wow is going to be next week. <laughs> <laughs> We're breaking news five days after it happened. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Anything else, Jason? I, I don't want to keep you. I know you got to you gotta get up crazy early. Yeah, I'll probably jump off. I said everything I could think of. All right. Well, I, as always, appreciate you coming on. All right. Thanks for having me, guys. I will talk to you all next week. Later, Jason. Awesome. Bye. Later, man. Thanks. So, Alex, what have you been up to? Not a ton, to be honest. Definitely not a lot of disc golf stuff. Trying to get some more movement into OKDGC. We're starting to get ready to put the red tees in. Or, you know, mark the red tees, not actually put in any actual tee pads or anything like that. So hopefully we can get some more traffic going there. When you say red tees, you mean all 18 or for the front nine? For the front nine. And we're starting to move on the back nine as well. It's just going slowly. Since the front nine is already in, you that's probably like of the 18, that would be the priority for the reds, I would imagine. Yeah. You know, yeah. have it all playable together. Yeah. For the reds, is it different tee pads and baskets or just different tee pads? Just different tee pads for now. Mm -hmm. We'll definitely consider doing different baskets, but that's a, that's going to be after the initial 18 goes in. Hmm. And it's not always necessary. Yeah. Are any of them going to be a combo platter or are the nine, I, since I haven't played it, I'm just curious, are the front nine all going to have a red tee? There's a couple that 
could be, you know, it might be one of the easier holes on, on the gold layout, but could be a, a difficult hole on the red layout type of thing mm-hmm. with the same tees. But there's such a jump between red and gold when it comes to difficulty level that it's going to be tough to have them share anything. Oh, fair. All right. Anything else? I think that's it. Just, you know, preparing for team challenges and trying to get everything set there. Awesome. You got New York next and then after that, New England the next week, right? Yeah, New York will be second Saturday, New England third Saturday, and then potentially the neutral for New York the week after that. Oh, wow. Depending on if that gets uh, if that's officially locked in or what. Hmm. We need to officially lock that down with Randy because we got... It's all on you, down. Alex. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm officially ready. <laughs> So I, I talked to Mark and he said he had also talked to you about that date and he was going to run it by the team. And then I don't think either of us have actually run it by the team. So that's how it goes. I believe in you. We'll get there <laughs> one way or another. We'll get there. So what have you been up to, Randy? This week, I actively didn't play disc golf because that double weekend really took a toll on my shoulder and elbow. Nothing like permanent, but just like Monday, I was I was sore. So I just told myself to take the week off, focused on photography a bunch this week. Yeah, not too much disc golf related. I have a disc of yours, Randy. I don't know what it is. Oh, man. Every time I banish a destroyer by throwing it somewhere I shouldn't, I'm like a little happy because I get to throw a different one off the shelf and then people find them. So, <laughs> yeah, it's like a factory to second, uh, factory second destroyer. Is it a DX destroyer? No, it's Star. Ooh. But it was it was just like the most plain Jane destroyer. And like, I did not care. I didn't really look for it. And then you found it. Did you throw a really bad throw? Is that no, you found no, it? I didn't find it. Eric, oh. you know, I'm forgetting his last name again, threw a really bad throw. Ah, you just call perfect. him Eric B. Eric B. It's a lot easier to spell than Boss and Brick with an E and two S's and an O and an E. He didn't have the best round. We played orange mind kill layout and he was way in the stuff on the right on hole seven. Yeah, I did that by throwing it. I think over and past all of it. And then the wind like sucked it back down and in there. It was was bad. Yeah. All right. Uh, So John, what have you been up to? Anything interesting this past week? I just played mind kill. I was at, Irvine, I didn't play, but I was there. So I got to watch all that MPO action. Saw Ethan pick up his win. Yeah, it was fun to watch. I kind of caddied for everybody at the same time. So the first round, I caddied for Muccelli for eight holes. Then I took two holes as a break. And then I caddied for Ethan for the remaining eight. And second round, Muccelli had the bright idea I should caddy for whoever had the box. So I was constantly switching which bag I had. So there was only an MPO field of four. Parker Cerrone, Muccelli, Ethan Hatters, and Adam Nelson. And Ethan has by far the most comfortable bag out of all of them, which you know <laughs> might be why he won. I don't know. But yeah, so I was hanging out there. But the, uh, the MPO scores were not that great on the day. I mean, I definitely could have been in contention if I played, but I think the hot round and just the overall best score on the day was Troy Whitten, MP40, and drove up from Binghamton. And I think he was seven down on the day, went three down, then four down. Eight down. Oh, he was eight down. Well, mm. he also played blind. That was his first time ever at Burbine. Yeah. Troy's a like, stupid strong player that nobody knows anymore. So it doesn't surprise me in the slightest to see him do that well out there. I'm really excited to see him kind of getting back into the scene and actually playing tournaments and stuff. He was like thousand rated for probably the first half of me disc golfing. And then he got, he had a surgery to, I want to say, fix a hip. He had a disgusting forehand, just like the farthest forehand most people have seen in the area and then messed up his hip somehow, probably at least partially due to that. And then just kind of been clawing his way back since then. He's 970, so not too shabby. A good guy too. He does a lot for the Binghamton disc golf scene. The myth, well, not really a myth, but the legend that I heard of him was he's a guy that gets referred to locally as the guy that cleared the creek at Heiser Creek on hole 12. You lost me at the myth, but not a myth, but it's a legend, which are (laughs) (laughs) Well, (laughs) Well, myth means it's kind of fake. Legend means that it was probably true. So we got a little bit of clarification on this. Every time you're on that hole, Morgan talks about, oh, Troy Whitten threw it over the, the stream of the forehand. And according to Tim, who was there that day, he says that it was a backhand and it was the farthest throw that he's ever seen on it. So much so that they had called it a lost disc and found it the next round because nobody had bothered to look over the stream. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, threw it too good. Yeah. <laughs> Got penalized for it. Since we're talking about it, the Montgomery County and Discat present the Blues at Burbine 4 in Charleston, New York. 
tournament director Jeff Wachowski. 62 players. I'll just go over the results real quick. FA3 Women's Amateur 3 was won by Krista Kovach. She beat Sherry Fish. MA3 Mixed Amateur 3, righty Highland Mike Warner, won that by five strokes over Justin Hickok. He needs to move up. That's his third MA3 win in three weeks. <laughs> I felt like I have said his name a lot, so... Uh, he did battle with Saratoga, Greenville, and now Irvine. It's October. Do we let him finish out the year and then really get on him 2025, or you're saying move up now? I'm saying move up now. What he told me is he's moving up in the discap region, but he still wants to play MA3 down south. I don't know why, but move up, Mike. <laughs> What's down south? Wedge territory. Oh, I feel like that's backwards. Mm. I'm just saying, like, he's got a lot of nicknames. He's got Highland Mike Warner. He's got Righty Mike Warner. Yeah. Does he really want to be known as Bagger Mike Warner? <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to say, Corey. Is like, we can consolidate this. <laughs> and, uh, and move up, Mike. <laughs> These are Hafner's words. I'm just saying them for him. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking them. All right. In all fairness, just to throw it out there, his rating, 859. Is that MA3? Yeah, it probably won't be that way for long. Yeah, I think it's been averaging 890, which is still technically MA3. What's the cap? 900? 900, yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, I technically just rated out of MA2. I'm, I think the cap for that's 935. Yep. But no, right. no one follows those. 100%. I'm just I, I'm just using it as a, as a rubric, Jamin. Mm. <laughs> See, Corey, teachers aren't the only ones to use I've those never words. heard that word out in the wild. Mm-hmm. All right, MA2 Mixed Amateur 2 was Peter Fitzsisti by a stroke over Zachary Jordan. Donald Corbett won MA50 Mixed Amateur 50 by one stroke over Jeff Darling. Speaking of Darlings, Carletta Darling won FA40 Women's Amateur 40. MA40 Mixed Amateur 40, Terry Hudson took it down over Kevin Relia. FA1 Women's Amateur 1, Megan Mercier won it over Julia May Marger. MA1 Mixed Amateur 1, Jeremy Forehand Florida Man Millian by a stroke over Troy Vasari. Did he wear shoes? He did wear shoes. And Troy Vasari by one stroke over Ryan Travis, 148 343. It was that close. I'm pretty sure Ryan had a fantastic first round. Fell off a little bit, but. Yeah, he had a one stroke lead over Jeremy after one and then came back down to earth in round two, but managed to hold on for third place. Greg Kurtz, MP50 winner by two strokes over Bobby Einrenhofer. We already spoke about Troy Whitten. He shot minus eight in the MP40 division, but Michael Thomas shot a respectable minus one. And third place goes to the Tower of Power, Jason Gorsage at a plus one. Amber Stout is your FPO winner. And I think we've mentioned also previously, Ethan Hatters shot a minus two to beat Justin Mucelli at an even. Good news, though. Justin got all the cash because Ethan still is am. Yeah, and payouts were fantastic. I don't know how much added cash there was, but... 1200 Yeah, so I think first place MPO was 300 something and Mucelli got 181 per second out of a four-person field. I forget that it's not like Justin gets a bonus for Ethan. Ethan will still get like... Yeah, he'll get funny money. I think it's... Yeah, funny money. Okay. Are they as close as being like the official providers for discap for that kind of stuff they are for this year officially hmm. yeah, kind of seems like it they make it really easy all right so that's the montgomery county and discap present the blues at burbine four so it looks like that's a potential for uh player of the year but we'll go over that in a, another oh minute, so. shit i didn't even think about this this gives freaking justin points on player of the year mm-hmm. i've been dogging him about how he didn't get been getting nothing all year second place is pretty solid even if there was only four people mm. We only count the top three. He's lucky I was leaf peeping in Vermont. It was a pretty well-run tournament. Jeff had a lot of nice stuff set up. He had, I think the county came in and they paid for pizza. There was a local orchard there, Bellinger, I think it was. And they had cider donuts, apples. They had cider. There was a place that came in and brought beer after the second round, which was included with a player's pack, which I think even pros got player's packs for this one. Oh, wow. There was also a, it was like a paddle board, an inflatable paddle board was up for grabs with the ace pot throw off and a guy named Jim Burns hit that. So he got the full ace pot and that inflatable paddle board, but there was a lot going on. Sounds like it. That sounds good. The only other thing I wanted to mention Riverside course in Port Jervis, this Saturday, October 26th, get ready for a fantastic day of disc golf activities. Whether you're helping out, playing for fun, or showing off your Halloween spirit, there's something for everyone. 9 a.m., kick off the morning by lending a hand with the construction of blue one and five tee pads. Volunteers are welcome. 
2.30 p.m. check-in, 3 p.m. start for a fun doubles play for all skill levels, whether you're new to the game or a seasoned player. Come out for a great time. All are welcome. And then at 5.30, check-in, 6 o'clock start. Cap off the day with a Halloween glow round. Wear your best costume and enjoy a fun, spooky round of disc golf under the night sky. So that's for Riverside. Anything else that anybody knows of that's going on this coming weekend? Yes, yeah, Stony Kill is going to do a big work day on Saturday the 26th. Uh, we're going to try and get hole two open, or at least as close as we can get to open. Heck yeah. It's kind of far for, I think, most listeners, but the Cranberry Classic is going on. It's down in Fairfield County, Connecticut. All right. You must not know about our Slovakian listeners. <laughs> yeah. We've got a wide reach is all I'm saying. There are 42 open spots for that one. Where was that again? Cranberry Park. It's in Fairfield. Field County, Connecticut, this coming Saturday, October 26th. Ooh, there's 42 spots left open? Yeah. You, you got something going on. Are <laughs> 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 you? Well, he does want to get up to that 960, right, Corey? Yeah, and then I found out that I was all excited to play the two-town turkey trot, probably, and then that got freaking canned by more team challenge, probably. Sounds like I'm going to be busy that weekend. Is that for disc captains or for, I would imagine, disc captains, right? Because it's later in the month? No, I think it's for... Neutral for New York? Yeah, unscheduled match, neutral match for New York team challenge. Oh, trickeration. Yeah, yeah, that would be November 23rd, the two-town turkey trot. Yeah, I think I'm going to be going to that one. But also, Corey, just to make you feel better, playing Cranberry blind wasn't going to help your rating at all. Oh, I played it for <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I played it for an ice bowl years ago when I was in the same situation where I was trying to probably hit like 900 or whatever. So I went down there and played it blind and it sucked ass because there's just freaking people walking everywhere. There's a bunch of dog walkers there. Yeah, I I think I've ranted about this before, but as much as I hate getting stuck on a hole waiting for the card ahead of me to play, it's even worse when you can't play a hole because there's just like endless waves of randos walking across the fairway during a tournament. And that was the first time I seen like a someone's dog actually like pick up a discs that was in play for a tournament that we thought might have been ob and then the dog picked it up and moved it and then dropped it I'm like well now we don't have no idea so i guess you're in bounds <laughs> hashtag cranberry <laughs> is everybody here good for a quiz yep yeah yeah darn tootin all right just a couple notes have we figured out the proper pronunciation of gnocchi you can ask. <laughs> i think you I got it i think you just said it yeah it's in gnocchi i think okay that is not how it's spelled it's literally spelled ganache ganache <laughs> I have some news for you, Corey. Sometimes things are pronounced differently from how they're spelled. <laughs> and why are they spelled? Did you hear that, Corey? <laughs> Welcome to the English language. Corey. <laughs> Although Corey sounds like Corey with an accent, so I'm fine with that. All right. I think that's everything. Peter Hodge can throw a lefty flick about 50 feet, so. <laughs> Russell Tool. He's not saying that he can't throw it 300, though. I think he's holding out on us. Mm. <laughs> But I think that's exactly what I was talking about with that buddy of mine who just looks silly. And yeah, 50 feet might be like max. <laughs> with uh... right. All right. So what do we want to do? John's a guest, so he gets to pick. Oh, God. Do you want to be on a team of two or a team of three? A team of two. I vote young guys versus old guys. You're all young guys. I think I need Alex. Boom. Mm. Yep, that's exactly what young I said. Guys. Young guys versus old mm-hmm. guys. All right. So typically... I let the team of two go first, but Corey is undefeated in team challenge picks. So for the month, he gets some kind of bonus. So he gets to go first, his team. Yes. So that'll be Corey, Randy, Jamin. I got the JPAP connection. Hell yeah. And then Alex. All right. So I've got plenty of rounds of disc or no disc. I got one I'm trying out. So I'm going to do three rounds this week. All right. I already drew my board. <laughs> I'm sorry, but one of them's like a... I want to try it out and see if it works as a as a category. So it's kind of a fun one. All right, all right, all right. So Corey, Randy, and Jamin, would you like to go category one, category two, or category three? Randy, what's your whiteboard say? I just erased it because I, I turned my <laughs> board sideways so I could fit three categories. Uh, so then three. Yep. That is my fun category. Mm-hmm. They're not all fun. Theoretically, they're all fun. But <laughs> this category has two answers for every question. So that means you have to tell me, are neither a disc? Is one of them a disc? And you have to be right with which one or are both a disc. Okay. All right. You ready? Yep. Question one, category three. If you're a steak and veggie creature, you're considered an omnivore. A combination of what other two basic vores? If you're a steak and veggie creature, you're considered an omnivore. A combination of what other two basic vores? An herbivore and a metaphor? What? <laughs> so close. It's semaphore. Oh, there you no. go. There you go. That's when you eat flags, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, carnivore. That's the other one. Right? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> carnivore and herbivore. Yep. Are you guys good? Yep. I think so. Is the carnivore or the herbivore or both or neither a disc? But the carnivore definitely is, right? I think carnivore is, and I don't know about herbivore. If there's a carnivore, there's got to be an herbivore, right? Also, why do you think a carnivore is a disc? Why are you so confident about that? I feel like I've heard of it. Yeah, I, I also think I've heard it before. Okay. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if herbivore is, given that like one third of the household that I spend the weekend with up in Vermont doesn't eat meat. Yeah, one fourth of the household that I stayed up with in Vermont doesn't know fractions. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I feel like if you're going to name a disc a carnivore, you're committed to the bit. So there's got to be an herbivore, right? Yeah, I'm, that's what I'm kind of leaning towards. Although I, it's either that or just carnivore. But you've kind of, I was thinking the same thing you were thinking. I think it's just carnivore. Actually, I take back what I said. I'm with Randy. It's just carnivore. <laughs> Well, then it doesn't matter what I said because Randy spoke last, apparently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's fine. I vote just carnivore. So All right. Put it on me. I like it. I was, I was going to say, it's either you're right and I win or I'm right and I win. And you win. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So are you guys going with just carnivore or both? Yeah, yeah just carnivore. They are. Carnivore Reptilian Disc Golf, October 26, 2023. Herbivore is not a disc. Oh, yeah, suck it, Jamin. Even though we're on the team. <laughs> Wait, no, I won. Enjoy those points. <laughs> Thank you. He either gets points or satisfaction. It works <laughs> both ways, Corey. It was a win win yeah. proposition for Jamin. He had his bets. <laughs> Alex and John, what category? One, two, or three? I do want, don't want to come up with two answers. Well, is two answers worth twice the points? I assumed that was just one point. Like one point for getting both answers and then one point for getting the disc, right? They got a lot of options. Mm. Go ahead. Choose, Alex. Let's go two. All right. Question one, category two. What homophone can mean to put in the ground or a small juicy fruit? What homophone can mean to put in the ground or a small juicy fruit? Sounds like a berry to me. Yeah. You guys good? Yeah. Yep. Is the berry a disc? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Clash discs. I don't know when. Probably 2023. November 22nd, 2021. I was going to oh. say, it's a lot older than that. That's one of their staples right now. I genuinely didn't know they've been around for three years. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Corey, Randy, and Jamin. What category? One, two, or three? I don't really like three because they give so many <laughs> answers anyway. I feel like we should save three for the end as well. It's it's a lot. Let's un- should we unpack one? Yeah. There's yeah. going to be some drama at the end. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Question one, category one. What was the nickname of Bo and Luke's fast-moving 1969 Dodge Charger on the Dukes of Hazard? What was the name of Bo and Luke's fast-moving 1969 Dodge Charger on the Dukes of Hazard? The General Lee. That sounds right. Yep. That's what I remember it. Is the General Lee a disc? Canceled. Oh. <laughs> oh, I can see it being a Lone Star I, I, disc, but I just can't see it being a disc. Like, what would they use for the I don't stamp? Think it's I mean, a disc. would that even, I don't know if they could do that anymore. It's a statue laying on its side. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a funny stamp. <laughs> it's a General Lee a disc. I kind of want to say no. Yeah, let's I just do too. let's go no. You are correct. Yay! All right, Alex and John, four to two, but they got a question ahead of you. So what do you got? I have no preference. What category did they do last time? One. So we've had a question from one, two, and three so far. Yeah, let's go one. Sure. All right, question two, category one. Whose 1865 pursuit helped hasten Lee's surrender? A year later, he was sent west to deal with the Indians and passed into history. Whose 1865 pursuit helped hasten Lee's surrender? A year later, he was sent west to deal with the Native Americans and passed into history. That would be Custer, right? That was my thought, yeah. Yeah. I don't have any solid, you know, I I have feelings, but I don't have solid fact on that. But It it definitely definitely is Custer. I mean, going a little nerdy on the history, he was a big strategist, so he would be following a little bit, and he was definitely out west and died out there. Strategist? Would he have been like, following clues possibly to the kitchen with a candlestick? <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's mustard? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Thank yeah. Thank you. Maybe Corey's thinking of the British version. I don't know what they mean. <laughs> Fish fingers and custard. Are you guys good with that, Custer? Yeah, I'm happy with Custer. Uh, George Armstrong Custer is the Custer a disc. I don't want it to be a disc. I don't think it is. Is it a word other than his name? I don't think so. 
I would err on the side of no. Yeah, I'm definitely feeling no. My metagaming brain is like, if it's going to be, you know, like generals and stuff the entire way down, then that feels like a like none of them are going to be discs. But that wouldn't be a category if none of them are going to be discs. Hmm. Or, or is, is it? Or is it? Yeah, I, I, I think we just got to go with our uh, gut here, Alex. <laughs> All right, I'm good with that. Let's go with no. No, you are correct. Tied after two rounds. Corey, Randy, and Jamin, one, two, or three. I vote two. Yep. Sounds good. All right. Question two, category two. Pizza purists blame Ontario restaurateur Sam Panopoulos for popularizing Hawaiian pizza featuring what fruit? Pizza purists blame Ontario restaurateur Sam Panopoulos for popularizing Hawaiian pizza featuring what fruit? There's no way his name is actually Panopoulos, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's... <laughs> P-A-N-O-P-O-U-L-O-S. It might be a different way to pronounce it, but I got Panopolis. Like Pineapolis? Yeah. That... Is that what you were hearing, Corey? Yeah, of course I was. He put pineapple on pizza and his last name just happens to be Panopolis. Dude, I didn't even make that connection until you <laughs> said it. That's so good. <laughs> So it would be pineapple, right? I mean, Avi. Yeah. It is, but I wonder if he had other ventures trying to get pineapple used in certain ways because <laughs> of his last name. And this is like the only one that stuck. <laughs> like, let's use pineapple instead of cooking oil. A BLPT. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, pineapple. You guys good? Yeah. Yep. Is the pineapple a disc? They are kind of is spiky, it? and you'd like to throw spike hyzers with your pineapple, maybe. Is it a clash disc? I know they've got like the berry, and they've got. Other ones, too, that I'm not going to name? You'd have to ask Kyle. He's the only one. It could totally be. Sorry, Randy, you were saying? No, I had no. I have nothing to back it up. I feel like it could be, though. Mm, I mean, pineapple is one of the better fruits. So for that reason, I say yes. Let's go. Yeah, maybe he'll say it was today or something. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You say pineapple is a disc. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, no. Oh, man. Let's go, Alex. Alex and John could take the lead. What do you got? One, two, or three? Do we follow them to fruits, or are you confident in your history? I kind of like the history. Sure. That doesn't necessarily mean it's history. It just means general comes before it. Could be. Or like no guarantees general. yet. Who knows? So category one? I'm happy with one. Yeah. All right. Question three, category one. What is the appropriate last name of the Union General whose headquarters was called a combination of barroom and brothel? What is the appropriate last name of the Union General whose headquarters was called a combination of barroom and brothel? Oh, okay. you got? <laughs> uh, it's got to be someone decently well known union general who did we have on the union my history general? runs out around the revolutionary war so i'm uh, i'm a little behind on on my civil war stuff okay so like by runs out around the revolutionary war you mean before that <laughs> yeah. the civil war happened after that no yeah i'm i'm saying i am good before the end of the revolutionary war for the most part well that's just backwards <laughs> <laughs> all right why can't i think of the name like there is a famous union general that i just cannot think of the name of who's like the main guy yeah i'm drawing a blank right now i don't know why abraham i guess i'm not as uh <laughs> did you just say abe lincoln <laughs> he, he said abraham hey but... lincoln <laughs> I mean, Allen was a general, but that, that's not, and I think he was fired, but that's not a disc. I'm, I'm like confident that McAllen is not a disc, which means you had, oh God, what's his name? It's Grant. Was it Grant as like the main yes, guy? Yes, he was. Yes. Thank you. But I don't think that fits the question. What was the question again? What is the appropriate last name of the Union General whose headquarters was called a combination of barroom and brothel? I don't know. It's got to be something decadent or something. I know McAllen was fired, but again, it's not like, what would he get fired for? We're spending too much time in the broad room and brothel. You want to just go with McAllen, <laughs> even though it's not a disc? Like, I think the name has to have something to do with. So then go Grant. Why not? I don't think Grant makes sense either. I don't, I, I got nothing. Well, we don't have any other generals coming to mind right now. No, nah. Whatever you're feeling like, go for oh, it. Oh, God. And just go with Grant. Sure. What do you got, Corey, Randy, and Jamin? Randy, what do you got? What is the appropriate last name of the Union General whose headquarters was called a combination of barroom and brothel? I'm more confused as to why Hafner was so locked up on someone being fired. If you have a barroom and a brothel, I could see there's a definite connection there. Mm, yes. Um... All right. Do you guys know any Civil War generals on the Union side that weren't Grant? Nope. Nope. Uh, Washington? No. Oh, wait, Civil War. Think about presidents. There was like a good amount of presidents who were, you know what I mean? Garfield was the only other one. How did I know more about this bullshit in like third grade? How did you know more about it when you had been recently taught it? Yeah. Mm. Huh. I wish there were a rubric to explain that. <laughs> 
Well, <laughs> I, I think you're stretching the definition there. <laughs> I, I, yeah, no, just try it. <laughs> the crux of the question is appropriate. So right, I know had a nickname. So a nickname general, but then their actual last name didn't help us. Mm, but I general just laying it out there. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I just thought appropriate meant like it made sense for what he was doing, not that it was like an appropriate name. Oh, like, is it, does I, that, you know? That's not how I took it. Yeah, I think it's his legit name. I think the answer is his legit name as yeah. well. I just thought it meant he had a nickname. Oh, I think his, what it's saying is that his, like, his actual name hints towards drinking and. Um, oh, so then it's McAllen. McAllen? Oh, because it's, ooh. Cause it's a whiskey. I like it. Let's do it. I, yep. Yeah, nothing that's else. That's way better than anything I've had. Oh, yeah. That's what I was going to say, too. McAllen. You guys good? McAllen? Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. We're looking for Joseph Hooker. Hooker. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's fair. Man, right on the nose. <laughs> disc Golf Association, January 1st, 1982. No points they had awarded. They disc called Hooker? <laughs> it could golf. mean In like... In 1982, early. they did. That's like a very overstable disc. It hooks up. It hooks hard. Yeah, that sounds great. Right. Out there hooking. That's what I'd be saying. Yeah. All right. That was originally... That was originally ours. So Your question. Down. So, Corey, Randy, and Jamie, and you're up 5-4. What category would you like? One, two, or three? I like two better. Yep. <laughs> okay. All right. Question three, category two. The National Promotion Board for what food? Citrullus linatus lists hydration as a primary health benefit. The National Promotion Board for what food? Citrullus linatus lists hydration as a primary health benefit. Citrus fruit. Sounds like citronella. Uh, <laughs> Nellis. I want to go orange just because, you know, like uh, you cut up oranges for kids at soccer games. Plus hydration. Are oranges commonly linked to hydrating? Yes. Latanus. Just for spelling, it's C-I-T-R-U-L-L-U-S, L-A-N-A-T-U-S. How do you spell that last part, Pat? L-A-N-A-T-U-S, Lanatus. Didn't help at all. Citrullus. <laughs> Is it possible that it has nothing to do with citrus? Mm-hmm. Like watermelon? Like if we're just talking hydration? I feel like watermelon would have a different Latin name than Citrullus Lanatus. I agree. Although I like the way you're thinking and that you're thinking. I can't think of anything. I, I like orange. Berry, pineapple, or... I also have a hard time believing that that name is for an orange. Like, they really condensed it and used nothing from the Latin to make the word name orange. It's a color. Yeah. One that didn't exist (laughs) back then. (laughs) (laughs) Orange, lemon. Like, I don't know. There's no other citrus fruits that I think hydration, like lemons and limes, are not. Yeah. No, it's a... (laughs) No, I, I think... Uh, orange is our best bet. I'm sure it's not kiwi. No. Okay, orange. No. <laughs> <laughs> you guys good with orange? Yep. What do you got, John and Alex? No. Oh, no. I mean, I was definitely on lemon the whole way. The National Promotion Board for what food? Citrullus linatus. This hydration as a primary health benefit. I was thinking that's why people do like lemon water. Like that's why that's the common thing for. Yeah, but the lemon is not the primary source of hydration there. Unless you're just sucking on lemons to stay hydrated, Alex. <laughs> um, no, I'm going to go with no on that one. I feel like the lemon is just a bad name for a disc, though. Like you buy a lemon. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you have a better option. What about lime? What are the differences between limes and lemons? Yeah, limes and lemons are like incredibly similar, especially like on a genetic level. And do we want to go with lime? If you're feeling good about lemon, go for it. I don't know that either is a disc, but a lemon just feels like a bad disc name to me. Yeah, I'm I'm with you that I don't like it as a disc, but I think it's the answer. I don't know. It, it's it's a steal anyway. Sure, we can go with lemon. I'll trust it you. It's a yeah. steal. Captain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, captain, my captain. Let's, let's go with lemon. And uh, it'll be my fault if it's wrong. Okay. All right, you guys good? Yep. We're looking for watermelon. <laughs> oh, <laughs> are you kidding? <laughs> nope. And it is not a disc. Yeah, see, yeah. people aren't just sucking on lemons, Alex. Come on. I did like Alex's explanation that you put lemons in water and it's hydrating. But I think I like John's explanation that it's more for flavoring than it is for yeah, hydration. It's a facilitator. Again, you're not sucking on lemons. You're adding yeah. it to the water. Kids like Hafner and Kyle Hirsch, like, I'm not drinking water. It tastes like nothing. But if you put a little <laughs> bit of lemon in it, it'll start I'll sucking water. water down. Yeah, see, they, it's the old bait and switch. I would not have gotten watermelon, thing. though. Hmm. I don't think of watermelon I as a have. citrus fruit. It's not. 
Yeah, it's just the trellis. Sure. Yeah, the trickeration. Plus that and the fact that there's those watermelon discs. That's why I liked it. Nice. You know, the ones that have the stamp. Yep, yep. But they're not called watermelon. Right? They they just put that stamp on anything, right? It's just the stamp. It's got to be an Axiom disc, but... Yeah, but, yeah, but each year it's a, it could be a different disc, right? Or a bag. Yep. yep. Mm. Right. And, and a bag and umbrellas and towels and yeah. But that was a steal for Alex and John. So now it's your regular question, right? Yeah. Uh, that sounds right to me. Still five to four. What do you got? Uh, one, two, or three. You want go ahead, Alex. Generals. I, I, I think I would prefer fruits. Okay. <laughs> Let's go category two. Question four, category two. Gardener John Paxton cultivated the most popular variety of what fruit and named it for his employer, William Cavendish. What Gardener John Paxton cultivated the most popular variety of what fruit and named it for his employer, William Cavendish. That is a banana. You're not going to get any argument from me here. Cavendish is a type of banana. And if I remember correctly, like it didn't used to be the most popular variety of banana, but then like some plague hit the first kind of banana that the Cavendish wasn't affected by. So now all the bananas that you get are Cavendishes. You're saying it was the second banana? <laughs> yeah. <they called> it. <laughs> if I remember correctly, I think it's like the fourth banana, but it is. Yeah, it's it's just it's just a pun. <laughs> yeah, <they're there. laughs> is there a Netflix documentary on this? Probably. I wouldn't be surprised if there was, but I haven't seen it. There's definitely a TED Talk. These are things you learn on the Hudson Valley Disc Golf Podcast. Is exactly. the banana a disc, Alex and John? For the I lead. I do not know that one. I haven't heard of it. I haven't either. I feel like that's a bad name for a disc also. But if you look at it, a hyzer is like the shape of a banana. If there was ever going to be a fruit disc before Clash started making discs, I feel like banana would be pretty high up on the list. Does anyone else name their discs after fruits? I don't know. <laughs> I haven't heard of it. I, I would say no. I mean, there's a lot of those like starter pack discs that have like weird names. Well, these have to be PDGA They have to be PDGA approved. Right? approved. That's true. I don't know. If you're feeling no, then I'm good with going no. I'm feeling no. All right. Say Go no. no. You are correct. Good call. All right. That was your regular question. It is now six to five. Corey, Randy, and Jamin, you're down one. What category would you like? One, two, or three? I almost like three. Want to try it again? I'm good with no, that. I feel like we should close out two. Okay. okay. I, yeah, that I mean, banana was the second to last one, so. I would not have gotten that one. Oh, I would no, have gotten that, that one. Yeah. Alex, how do you know so much about bananas? Couldn't tell you. I bet he listens to NPR sometimes. <laughs> this is probably, probably something I picked up on social media that was like talking about bananas, something or other. So you guys want category two? Yeah. Yep. All right. Question five, category two. Cultivation of what fruit dates back to at least the very pre-Columbian Makoya people, and it stood for the 14th month on the Maya calendar. Cultivation of what fruit dates back to at least the pre-Columbian Makaya people, and it stood for the 14th month on the Maya calendar. I'm thinking avocado. Ooh, do we want to go with that as fruit? I mean, yes. I mean, it is a fruit if that's the part you wanted to. Well, we could. This is a whole other freaking can of worms. But no, it's not. It's a. It comes from a tree. It's got a seed in the middle. It's I fruit. know, but like by any of any definitions, everything's a fruit. There's no such thing as a vegetable. That's what makes my job very easy, Jamin. All right, <laughs> name another fruit cultivated by indigenous people of Central America. Guava. Isn't that, isn't that the word for bat poop? No, that's guano. Oh. <laughs> you don't remember Ace Ventura when nature calls? Come yeah, on, no, man. Exactly what I'm right. Excuse me, Corey, your balls are showing. Bumblebee tuna. <laughs> I think Corey might be the deciding vote. I like both answers. Assuming that an avocado is a fruit. I don't know. Jamin being the, the non-meat eater, I'm more inclined to side with him. He sounds like he'd know more about vegetables and fruit. Could you ask us the question one more time? Cultivation of what fruit dates back at least to the very pre-Columbian Makaya people, and it stood for the 14th month on the Maya calendar. Okay, so you guys don't know the Mayan calendar? No. No, I stopped using it. Yeah. <laughs> After 2012, me too. Yeah, 2020. When, there was, when there was two extra <laughs> months, yeah. <laughs> I'm with Jamin because he has more knowledge on this subject. If it was a bird question or like what fruit is used in bird seed for the macacus monkey bird or whatever. So would you say uh, guava? I said guava. The only reason I said guava is because I happen to know it's a disc. Mm. Okay. I, I'm less like, <laughs> I don't like Jamin's answer as much anymore if that's the only reason. <laughs> Randy threw out a vegetable. <laughs> no, I didn't. That's crazy. You're crazy if you're saying it's not a fruit. But the avocado was a disc too, right? I have no idea. I feel like it is. Honestly. I think it is, yeah. 
All right, Corey, you you do whatever the hell you want, oh, man. This is no. on. It's time for some Corey magic. Yeah, I'm not mango um, now. Let's just throw out more. Yeah. If I had to choose between one of those two, I think I'm gonna go with the guava. Or is that what you guys are going with? Yeah. What do you got, Alex and John? <sighs> Whoops. So someone did just say mango. That kind of sounds. Yeah. I. It's... Who said mango? I know that's a disc. There's a lot of things that were going through my head. So the first thing that I was thinking about was cacao because i'm pretty sure that was in that general region but i think of them more aztec than mayan well that's why i'm kind of liking mango because mayan is a little further north than aztec mango is a disc too yeah it's a clash discs disc yeah i think mango makes more sense i think i was going for a reach with cacao so i i'm I'm feeling good about mango yeah let's go mango all right you guys good with mango Yeah, yeah yeah all right well the mango is a disc because we've already done it. Uh, we were looking for the avocado. Ah, uh, fair. Oh, yeah, yeah. We all, we all, <laughs> except for Randy. Which is not a disc, and I'm not sure anymore if it's a fruit or not. But <laughs> All right, so Alex and John, you're still up one. What category? One, two, or three? Do we finish out the fruits? Sure, why not? All right, let's do it. All right, question six, category two. Which fruit? native to Central America and widely cultivated in tropical and subtropical regions, is often described as having a flavor that resembles a blend of strawberry and pear. Which fruit, native to Central America and widely cultivated in tropical and subtropical regions, is often described as having a flavor that resembles a blend of strawberry and pear? I have no actual answer for this, so my thought is to go with guava. Uh, The only thing I know about guava is that pure guava is a ween album. (laughs) <laughs> that's all i know it's a, it's a tropical fruit i don't think you could just des- you describe a mango as a pear plus a strawberry well and it's there's not repeats right i mean Pat just oh said yeah and it's probably probably not mango <laughs> because we've yeah. already done mango that that tracks damn it <laughs> well yeah was, i'm still leaning towards guava sure you guys good i think so yeah. is the guava a disc no <laughs> uh, again going off jamin i'm gonna go with yes fuck <laughs> <laughs> thank you sorry <laughs> you good john yeah clash discs july 24th 2023 brian heller gave me the idea for that round because he's like if i made the banana disc it would always be orange (laughs) so what the the heck is a guava because the ween album they look like lemons almost they're like green i guess you could they're kind of lemon shaped they're kind of lemon sized so like a lime no it's very different (laughs) it's like it's got like a pink flesh to it it's usually in juices I only wish that I had more fruits available for that category because I used a lot of them on Clash. What Alex sent the photo, fruit designations are weird. Well, so Mm. isn't the actual definition of a fruit something that carries, it has something to do with the seeds, right? Yeah. There's like a scientific version of a fruit and then there's a culinary version of a fruit and they're two different things and I don't know how to define either of them. I think the scientific version is the part containing seeds. I've just never heard people refer to avocados as anything other than a fruit. Mm. It's not like we're talking about cucumbers right now. It's because it has a seed <laughs> and it grows. But in a scientifically, tree. I think a cucumber is a fruit. I know. I did the whole science thing for, <laughs> for, for years. <laughs> All right. So, Corey, Randy, and Jamin, it's eight to five. You guys have five. You go on category one or three. You guys choose this one. All right. Let's go to three. <laughs> yeah, let's go to three. I agree. Let's, yeah, let's jump out of this burning building. All right. Question two, category three in storytelling. What are the two contrasting archetypes that represent the protagonist striving for good and the antagonist seeking to cause chaos or harm? In storytelling, what are the two contrasting archetypes that represent the protagonist striving for good and the antagonist seeking to cause chaos or harm? You guys are big book people. Let's go. I'm not a big book person. Um, Hero and villain. Right? Is it that simple? Like that's I'm that's I'm like I can't I am not sure if I just don't understand the question or it's it is that. I think it's that easy. I hope the villain is a disc, right? That's a that's like a is it a DD disc? I'm not sure. I don't, the, I think you're thinking of a vandal, or is it a discmania disc? The villain? I don't know. I I actually don't know if either of these are discs. Are you guys good with the answer? First of all, I mean, yeah, we should probably lock in our answer for. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's get that far. <laughs> yeah, let's let's go with that. Sounds good to me. You guys agree? Yep. Yes. <laughs> is the hero and villain the hero or villain 
neither or both a disc. I want to say the villain is. I feel like they're both okay disc names. Yeah. Hero Disc is a company. Yeah, they make like the... They make the the Sonic. Yeah. I feel like Hero... I say both. Both are discs. Yeah, I think I'm good with that. Okay, let's go with it. All right. Villain, Latitude 64, April 1st, 2012. I'm going to ask Alex because he's impartial here. He has no benefit either way. Mm. (laughs) <laughs> so okay. the hero disc has three discs that i have the hero bullseye put and approach the hero stinger and the hero maximum which you could argue well that's just they're naming it after the company but in of a champion discs also has the hero disc type 235 alex would you say the hero's a disc i think the in of a disc would ca- I, I i don't if, if it was just the hero bullseye and stuff i would mm-hmm. say no but i think the in of a one definitely yes the reason i included the the other hero discs was because the Innova alone, I wasn't sure, but I think if you combine the two, I think that's enough hero evidence that these guys get the point. Yeah, so I would we say agree? give it to them anyway, because they need the help. I'll oh, take it. I will yeah, say you know, we don't want to do that. Things can flip so mm-hmm. quickly. No, 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 we got this, Alex. So it's eight to seven. Oh, that Alex and John, but you're a question you got a question in pocket. In what category? One or three? Happy with either, whatever you want to do. Let's go one. Sure. All right. Question four, category one. Who was the only person who died during the Civil War to be featured on Confederate currency? Who was the only person who died during the Civil War to be featured on Confederate currency? All right. So we got Confederate currency and it's somebody who died. That's so all we Lee's got. already been said. That was the first, right? Am yeah. I misremembering that? Yeah, no, yeah, I, I've got it written down. Lee was the first for sure. So your your biggest guy besides that was Stonewall Jackson. Was he dead by the time they were printing Confederate money? Well, the question says died during the Civil War. Did it? Uh, can can I hear the question again? Who was the only person who died during the Civil War to be featured on Confederate currency? Oh, yeah. No, then uh, I'm I am happy with Jackson. So yeah, he did die in battle. So okay, yeah, very, very happy with Stonewall Jackson there. You guys good with that? Yeah. Is the Jackson a disc? I don't know. Maybe there's definitely some stupid disc names out there, like the Bruce. Feels like it could be one of those discs that are also first names. I think of the ones we've heard so far, I'd say Jackson is most likely. Yeah, I would go with yes on that. Yeah, I, I'm I'm happy with yes. I'm sorry, no. Dang oh, that's fine. Yeah. But I would take this time to point out Mark Bryan because we're at the Stonewall Classic. He had the idea for a oh, Civil nice. War type. You know, not that we're done yet, but all right. Corey, Randy, and Jamin, what category? One or three? Stick with three. Yeah. yeah. I don't feel super confident in it, but I know I'm not getting a single Civil War question. Yep. Yeah, me too. All right. Question three, category three. What two terms describe the rise and fall of sea levels due to the gravitational pull of the moon and sun? What two terms describe the rise and fall of sea levels due to the gravitational pull of the moon and sun? Is it? Ebb and flow. That's what I was thinking, and I was trying to think of a separate word for tide. Right, I was, but it's, I couldn't think of one, so it must be ebb and flow. Yeah, all I could think of was tide. You guys good with that? Ebb and flow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm good with that. All right. Is the ebb and flow, the ebb or flow, both or neither a disc? The flow is a disc. Yeah, just the yep, flow. I, I know that one. Is ebb two letters? Ebb out of I think it's e b b. Even more ridiculous. Even, I yeah, I feel like out of context, that would be such an odd disc name. Not that we haven't had odd ones, but. Yeah, it just doesn't, doesn't. It's gonna, yeah. I'm just going to ebb right here. Right. Would you just throw an ebb? Oh, God bless you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I say flow. Just flow. Uh, yeah, just the flow. Yeah, yeah. Latitude 64, October 27th, 2010 for the flow. The ebb is not a disc and we are tied. Let's go. But Good Alex and John are a question ahead. One or three. What do you got? I am officially out of Civil War figures that aren't like super obvious. Yeah, we can go three. Yeah. So if you're confident in one, I can probably not help that much. But if you're confident, I have no problems doing it. But I feel like three is the stronger choice. Yeah, we can go three. Let's go three. Question four, category three. What terms are used to describe the siblings of your parents typically signifying a familial relationship that is not directly a parent or sibling? What terms are used to describe the siblings of your parents typically signifying a familial familial relationship that is not directly a parent or sibling because that is simple as aunt and uncle yeah it, like it feels like there should be more there siblings of your parents i feel like that has to mean i mean i mean yes 
it, like there's more to the question. Like if it was just the first bit, that makes sense. But if there, it, but with more to the question, can I hear the question again? What terms are used to describe the siblings of your parents, typically signifying a familial relationship that is not directly a parent or sibling? I think I'm happy with aunt and uncle because I, I think that's just I think the rest of the question is just talking about like it may not necessarily be it, it, like you have family friends that could be called aunt or uncle or something like that. Yeah, I'm good with that. I don't know. I'm probably overthinking it. I'm happy with aunt and uncle, though. Sure. Is good. Is the aunt and uncle aunt or uncle both or neither a disc? Now, would a n t count as a disc? I was just going to ask, does anybody here say aunt correctly or not correctly? Everybody's saying bugs. <laughs> well, wait, you aunt what? Aunt Randy? Yeah. No, yeah. Some people say aunt. Some people say aunt. Yeah, a u n t. Hmm. That's weird. <laughs> Did we get an answer to that though? I haven't given an answer yet. Yeah, I, I was good. trying to use Randy <laughs> thing to buy me some time, but yeah, you can you can use it as either version. It's phonetical. All right. I don't know if it's a disc though. <laughs> I don't, like I think a n t is much more likely to be a disc than a u n t, but we can go with neither. I don't like either of them. Yeah, I think I'm happy going with neither. Either. Yeah, that works. I mean, let, let's think about this. You got to decide is it neither or neither, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> We're tied right now. We've already got the one point that puts us one up, and we shot second in terms of questions. So oh, it, it's, you know. Yeah, there's four questions left. So, yeah. it, like, there's still a lot of time left. Yeah, we can go with neither, neither, however you want to say it, aunt, aunt. Yeah, I think I'm happy with, with neither. You guys are good? I'm happy with neither. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess we gotta <laughs> go with that on. one. The ant or ant or aunt is not a disc. Uncle, though, Pie Pan Discs, November 28th, Dang. 2022. Did you say Pie Pan Discs? Pie yeah. Pan Discs, yep. All right, you are up by one, Corey, Randy, and Jamin. One or three? Three. Mm-hmm. All right, question five, category three. What two ancient and opposite forces are symbolized in China by a white tiger and an azure dragon? What two ancient and opposite forces are symbolized in China by a white tiger and an azure dragon? Uh, that would be yin and yang. <laughs> I mean, is it though? And is it not just yin? <laughs> Is there no G in Ying? Yang? Yin? Oh, no. That, that is correct. Oh, God. <laughs> How does it feel? Making fun of how we say ant and you can't even say yin, right? Come on. Yin, yin. I do You're believe right. I've heard You're both so variations, right. though I do think the ying is when people fuck it up and they just say, yeah, that works too. Kind of I still think it's no chi, by the way. Kanachi, yeah. So is Ugh. it yin yang? Is that what you're saying? I mean, that is like white and black, but are they symbolize it for lions and tigers and bears or whatever you said? White tiger and azure dragon. Oh, dragon. Way more badass. Uh, Jamin, you got any input? That sounds good. I mean, it's uh, like yin, the yin yang is kind of like a catch all for all opposing things in mm -hmm. China. Yeah, so, Chinese thing yeah. like Japanese, right? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. Well, I think it's. A Taoist symbol it seems way too simple to be correct after having ebb and flow. So yeah, yin yang. <laughs> mm -hmm. You guys good? Yep. Is the yin or yang or yin and yang a disc or neither or both? I don't know what either word means. Therefore, I have no idea if they make sense alone on a disc. I don't know how. Many yeah, I feel like there's a Chinese company. Yeah. So I feel like they would have at least one of them. But I don't know if I'm just making that up. Because, like, does it actually mean, like, chaos and order? So it'd be cool to have a disc, like, of each. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like opposites, light, dark. Yeah. We would assume that one of them is a disc, but we could not, we would never be able to come up with which one of the two is a disc. Then we should just say that both are a disc. Or, what? I agree with your All logic. All or nothing, already. right? Yes. Exactly. I don't think we're going to pick one randomly. There hasn't been a no-no yet. No, 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 no. No, no, yeah, no. it's both. You think it's both? Yeah, because of course it is. How can you argue with that logic? Mm. <laughs> I could argue with avocado. This is to take the lead, right, Alex? If they get it right. Uh, that's what I have on my board. 10-10? 10-10 right now with this answer pending. Wait, 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 wait. Mm. We got the one point last round with getting... Yeah, we were, we were at And that put you guys up one. one. Yeah, yeah, that put us up one. We were tied going into that, Alex. Mm -hmm. So now you're tied... Yeah, we were up one, and then they just got one point worth of oh, question, right? We're and now we're tied. It is scored. Okay. They have correctly answered the it, first it part counted. of the question, so it, it has been counted. Uh, so we're saying both or neither? I want to go neither. 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 Okay. Yep. Go neither. EV7, October 7th, 2024, for both of them. Whoa. Mm. This one was what gave me the idea for the category. The jury's still out whether or not it's a good category, but 
Hmm. Alex and John, one or three. How many of each remain? We got one and three and two and one. Yep. I think they're less likely to get one. So Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I think we finish out three. Yeah. All right. Question six, category three. What two contrasting emotions are often described as fundamental to the human experience, with one representing happiness and the other representing suffering? They were also the title of a song by hip hop duo Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock which reached number nine on the Billboard U.S. Dance Club charts in 1989. What two contrasting emotions are often described as fundamental to the human experience, with one representing happiness and the other representing suffering? They were also the title of a song by hip-hop duo Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock, which reached number nine on the Billboard U.S. Dance charts in 1989. I don't know. (laughs) I have guesses. Oh, God. What are you thinking, Alex? My first thought was joy and sorrow. That's all I got. <laughs> Joy and sorrow. Yeah, I don't think that's it. <laughs> fair, I mean, fair. Uh, Can what you, you got, repeat though? the first part of the question again, Pat? Not the song part. I got you. What two contrasting emotions are often described as fundamental to the human experience, with one representing happiness and the other representing suffering? Happiness. The second and... part was just my for my fun, so I, I appreciate that. Happiness and suffering. I like joy. I don't know how I feel about sorrow. I mean, joy and sorrow is what sticks out in my head as I mean, I'm not like coming the, up with anything better right now. The classic opposites, but I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not coming up with anything better, so we can go with it. Yeah, call it, call it, call it, call it. Yeah, call it, call it. <laughs> Going with joy and sorrow. Sounds right to me. What do you got, Corey, Randy, and Jamin? Dang it. Uh, I think it's love and hate. Yeah, that was what I was going to say. Mm-hmm. Yep. You guys agree? Corey, I'm sorry. Corey, you agree? Oh, yeah, yeah, I do, for sure. We were looking for joy and pain. Uh, yeah. Sunshine. We're almost there. And rain. Pain, latitude 64, January 10th, 2011. The joy is not a disc. You're welcome, Kenji. Final round. We are <laughs> tied. Corey and Randy and Jamin. Question five, category one. What middle name of Civil War General William Sherman honored a Shawnee chief? What middle name of Civil War General William Sherman honored a Shawnee chief? <sighs> the middle name of Sherman is a Shawnee chief. William Sherman, but yeah. It was like Buffalo or something. It sounds good. Who the hell's knocking? <laughs> Not me. Uh, you keep a knocking, but you can't come in. It might just be like weird audio things. I've had a couple of weird things tonight. It's that dude in that our neighbor in Vermont fucking playing. Oh my god! Fucking bucket drumming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, you said Buffalo. I'm just trying to think of uh, right. Uh, Do you, you know, know where the Shawnee resided? Word. No. I want to say Georgia. Can you? I hear the question one more time, Pat. What middle name of Civil War General William Sherman honored a Shawnee chief? Dances with wolves. I don't know. I thought he was in the South. Could be Could anything. Could there be any animal? Eagle? No. It's a disc, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Used the one e- eagle a few times. Man, 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 man. Yeah, I feel like any, like, native animal. Yeah, any, like, iconic animal. Majestic, yeah. I might even say. Black bear. I don't know. Buffalo. Bear's a disc. I don't know. Mm, yeah, I'm. I it's it's all a guess. So I'm really I'm fine with whichever we decide. I can't. You know what I mean? Like I don't know. I feel like that's the timeline of the Civil War. Maybe not Buffalo, because somebody who was fighting in the Civil War probably wouldn't be named after a chief way out west. Yeah, I kind of like Bear. Now that we threw it out there. Okay. Yeah, I'm bear, fine with that. Bear. Wait, uh, was the uh, there's a lot of bears being thrown around this past weekend? Is that like a newer disc? It is. It's like a year like old. Even more than bear. What do you got, Alex and John? Fuck. <laughs> do you have a good answer? Because I have a crap answer. Can you repeat the question before Alex gives his crap answer? <laughs> what middle name of Civil War General William Sherman honored a Shawnee chief? Shoot, Alex. The only chief that I'm thinking of is Sitting Bull. Well, that was Lakota. Yeah, I, that's that the Lakota, only thing I had. So that's, uh, the whole Custer. Okay, so not that. Or that relates to Sitting Bull, I'm pretty sure. All right. Uh, which would be the wrong side. Yeah. How do you dorks know so much about this stuff? Freaking <laughs> four varieties of bananas, some, the, the pamphlet <laughs> of a freaking... It's very Randy-esque knowledge where it gets around everything but the actual answer. You know? <laughs> yeah, right? What did Sherman do? Did Sh- Was it Sherman's March to the Sea? Was that a thing? You're losing me there. I don't know. I am just randomly coming up with anything vaguely Civil 
were war related and probably coming up with other wars instead. I have something really stupid in my head and I don't know why it's it. in my head. I, it's better than anything we have. We we have one confirmed wrong answer. It's not the answer. It's not a name, but it's in my head. I, well, what is it? Because it's probably yeah, entertaining it podcast. So stupid. I don't know why the name Peabody is in my head right now, but it's <laughs> not even a middle name. But if you want to go. I mean, it could it, be a middle name. I don't. Is it William P. Sherman? Or is that P. Sherman is Peabody. Finding Nemo? <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> you still got a, the final question. It's tied right now. Yeah, we, we still have or a chance to You don't have win. to get this one right. Go with Peabody, even though it's not probably the right answer. Uh, dude, I'm, I'm with you. It's better than anything we've come up with so far. All right. Well, before we I give you the actual answer, I just want to say Corey was thinking Tatanka for Buffalo from Dance with Wolves. <laughs> <laughs> and which was the closest it was tecumseh william tecumseh oh. sherman oh i should have known yeah. the classic six and a half horsepower single cylinder engine they put on everything back then well not back then but was that the tecumseh i'm pretty sure the tecumseh is like a power tool engine for like tillers and hmm. go-karts and stuff oh, that's good to see again you learn a lot on this part uh so final question alex and john can win it was tecumseh a disc no it was not, but there was that. like an Indian name at some point, and I thought, hey, they might buy this as well. Yeah. And you know what it is? I just I just checked. Peabody and Sherman is a TV show. Oh yeah, you know, yep, cartoon. Yeah, Mr. Yeah, Peabody, we, Mr. Peabody. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. All right, final question. This is for Alex and John. You don't even have to tell me if it's a disc. If you get it right, you win. Only four men have been both vice president and president and served in both houses of Congress. Two of them shared what last name? Only four men have been both vice president and president and served in both houses of Congress. Two of them shared what last name? Johnson feels right. I had a lot of names in my head. Johnson makes sense. Well, so Johnson took over. I think he was Abe's vice president. That, I mean, sure. And Johnson's pretty generic, so I would go yeah. with Johnson. Obama. <laughs> that tracks timeline-wise, I think. We can go with that. Yeah. That's good. It's better than any of the names I was coming up with, so I'm happy with Johnson. I would love to hear some of the names you're coming up with. <laughs> uh, do we want to do it before or after you tell us it's right? <laughs> That's up to you. Are you going with Johnson? Yeah, I think we're going to Johnson. Yeah, it was Andrew Johnson, I believe. Is the Johnson a disc? Well, we nice. already won, so... Yeah, but we gotta we gotta do the victory lab. No, no, no. I know, I know. <laughs> Is the Johnson a disc? No. We gotta go with our no, guy here. It's a terrible was, disc name. Was the Jackson a disc? No. Is the Johnson a disc? Probably not. Is the Bruce a disc? For some reason, yes. But I think <laughs> we have to go with no. I'm happy with no. Bernoulli, April eighteenth, twenty twenty four. Yeah, no. I started going towards names that I'd known had been president twice. And so like Bush and then I went for like Ford because I don't know why that popped in my head. Yeah, but, who'd you have? Yeah. You had Andrew Johnson and Lyndon B. Johnson. B. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good call. Shut up, fellas. John Tyler and Richard Nixon. Hmm. So you guys win 11 to 10. Nice. Got there. Congratulations. What about the two answer category? What do you guys think? It's cool. I like it. I feel like it's very difficult to get the second point. So maybe it's like, a, maybe you break it down per disc and there's like two points available for the, if it's a disc or not type of thing. I thought about that, but then I thought everybody would go for that category first. Also a possibility. Maybe, maybe that ends up being a night when. Yeah. Where it's just those like type that. of. Uh, yep. Yeah. That's a good. Yeah, idea. that's what I was thinking. Or I think I was that to the third category, and that only unlocks after the first two are gone. That's a good point too. Like a final yeah. round. Yeah. All right. So yeah. I guess it would it would be based on time. Did anybody have anything? Any events coming up before we go? Just the Stony Hill work day that I was thinking about. Cranberry Classic. So this weekend, Cranberry Classic, Stony Hill work day, this captain's match, this captain's match, or. The Riverside? River, yeah. I also, I forgot. I think it's Terry's monthly. Is that this weekend, the 26th? Terry Hudson at Dove Creek. I feel like that's the discap monthly is this weekend at some point. Maybe it's the 27th. I don't actually know. I believe it's Saturday. Okay. Mm -hmm. So a lot of stuff this weekend. If you can get out to disc golf. Ghoul's Fest is also going on, but it's full at this moment. All right. So thank you, Corey, Alex, Randy, Jason, Jamin, and John. And sweet up, Hudson. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Thanks, Pat. Pat. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, guys.
the dung beetles are very fascinating. We must hear it not. <laughs> <laughs> the ash boring beetles that are providing clean firewood for uh, for Corey Cook. Dozens of wood burning folk. <laughs> mm. Notably, not weevils. Oh, are they weevils? No, they're definitely not. Yeah, no, they're not. Uh, we had a quiz question about them, and you thought they were beetles, and I thought they were weevils, and I convinced you to go with weevils, and we were wrong. Oh, because I just had a conversation about weevils versus moles, but I must have been with a buddy at work. Which weevils are kind of weird fucking creatures. I mean, so are moles. They, they're all weird, but... Yeah. What about a bull weevil? <sighs> I only like one animal cross the bull, and that's a bullfrog. No, no, no. Bo- not <laughs> bull weevil. It's called a bull weevil. B O L L. Yeah. And that's actually a uh, song from the presidents of the United States. <gasps> the people that sing the peaches song? Yeah. Yep. Mm. And, and lump. the millions of peaches? And a lump. Mm-hmm. Yep. And lump. Yeah. I will also have to check on my dinner, which tonight is just going to be an air fryer load of Tostino's pizza rolls. <laughs> 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 Nothing wrong I mean, I'm that. even eating yours, Jamin. Ah, oh, shit. The cheese ones, the ones that have no meat. Oh, my God. How will you ever survive? I'm going to have to eat twice as many for the protein. Corey, you'll never guess what I saw the other day. A cyber truck. Mm. I actually got passed by one on the Taconic, but that's not what I was talking about. I saw a Honda Accord with Connecticut classic car plates. Ooh, damn. That must have been a boxy one. It must have been like an 88 or something. I think it's only got to be 20 years old for Connecticut. Oh, what? That, they consider 20 years old a classic? Mm-hmm. That was like 2019, 2009. <laughs> and this thing wasn't... What? 2004. <laughs> no, I, no, I'm just saying 20 years. <laughs> it seems a lot longer. <laughs> But as long? I don't know. it didn't even look like it was maintained. It looked like it had been driving since whatever it came off the line. You know what I mean? It was like, how, how do you get classic car plates on that? Oh, lived a hard life. <laughs> mm. That's a working man's Honda Accord right there. Yeah. Aren't there like restrictions as far as how much you can drive those things if they have classic plates? Well, I don't know what Connecticut does, but I'm pretty sure in New York, like, yeah. Well, classic plates, maybe not, but like classic car insurance which is supposed to be cheaper then yeah you're only supposed to drive it that's it's not supposed to be it's supposed to be for pleasure you know only a few thousand miles a year i thought about looking into that when i had my uh geo metro yeah and drive that very often if you see one of those now it don't be a classic because they're probably all rotted out by now i had one just a couple years ago shit yeah i sold it to who i'm trying i should hit him up the guy who who knocked on my door and said hey is that car for sale my wife answered and i told her yeah go sell it i don't care <laughs> I think they converted it into some kind of off-road kind of like dirt bike. You're not not dirt bike, but you know what I'm Lifted talking about. Like dune buggy tires. kind of thing. Yeah. But I actually was getting gas one time, and a guy pulled up and gave me his card and said, hey, if you ever want to sell that. So they were sought after, I guess. That's more than just me out there that's that's weird. Like, I acquired this 1993 Pontiac Grand Am a couple years ago. And literally, as I'm leaving work, like turning through an intersection, some guys at a red light shouts at me, Hey, you want to sell that thing? Like what? Who would who would really want a plain Jane basic 1993 Grand Am enough that you're going to shout at the guy that's turning mid intersection? <laughs> that guy, apparently. I don't know. I just kept driving. I ignored him. Same year as the Metro, I believe. <laughs> Uh, down the street around the corner from my house, there's a purple Chevy Tracker, which is you know, Geo Tracker. Geo Metro. Well, they they sold both. Mm. Was the Geo called the Tracker? My sister had a Geo Tracker, but it did. If you looked at the the, the Geo symbol in the on the grill, it had a little Chevy symbol. So I think I think They're it goes branded. Yeah, but like that's a classic, like four wheel drive little matchbox car mm-hmm. that. I mean, I would hate to roll over or get T-boned by a tractor trailer in one of those things. But. She did get the year after they widened the wheelbase. So I don't <laughs> they know. They weren't so tippy. Yeah. I think it's just less so, not, you know, yeah. not not tippy, just less tippy. <laughs> but just waiting on Randy. All right, just give me a minute to go check on my vegetarian pizza rolls. No, not anymore. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Damn it. Now we see her. No, go check. <laughs> no, yeah, I'll be right back. <laughs> you were going to say. <laughs> I guess I could actually begin because we're going to talk to Jada to start, so we don't necessarily need Corey back. Oh, I'm back, baby. Oh, I'm here. There you go. <laughs> Which I will say, I'm sure this is news to nobody, but air fryers are pretty nice. 
Mm -hmm. I was surprised at how fast and evenly cooked these Tostitos pizza rolls. And the nice thing is, it even exploded the corners for me preemptively. So they should get a a faster cooling rate so I don't burn the fuck out of my mouth. How long did you put them in for? I think it was set for 380 for, God, I I think it said 45 minutes, which seems way too long because there's only two minutes left on the timer. (laughs) Uh, But they seem perfect. So I don't know. Possibly 20 minutes in in an air fryer for at 380 is the perfect amount of time. As opposed to a microwave for a minute and a half. Uh, I would... (laughs) They definitely do not taste as good in a microwave, but no, I am true. not against microwaving the shit out of them and having a meal ready in a minute and a half. Yeah. A meal, end quotes. <laughs> like an Uncrustable. <laughs> I got those in the fridge, too. Ooh, throw an Uncrustable in the air fryer for a little bit. Damn. You, Randy, you got yourself a deal. <laughs> if he does it now, it's going to taste like pizza, though, isn't it? Ah, shit. That's a no, good point you get too. those disposable liners and you'll be Yeah, fine. those wax paper liners. Can you put parchment paper in? You think Corey got those? Yeah. <laughs> no, you can put parchment paper in. You cannot put wax paper in. Sorry. Yeah, I meant parchment paper. You can put wax paper in. It's not going to go well, but. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, hmm. you physically can do it, but you will not have a, a functioning air fryer, probably. We could test that theory. Mm-hmm.